powered by the Perdomo Cigar Studios on the Red Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from the HF Barcelona Studios in Euless, Texas. Welcome to Primetime Special Edition 86. Tonight, we welcome Tony Bellotto from La Barbara Cigars. We have our One Must Go segment. Great things are happening here and another Altadas giveaway. Plus, we decide once and for all the GOAT argument. And as always, Primetime Special Edition is sponsored by Perdomo Cigars, awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary brand has consistently earned the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary blend requires tobaccos that have been carefully hand-selected and are well aged for a minimum of eight years. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun-grown, and a dark Dark oily Cuban seed Nicaragua Maduro. Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel aged wrappers with thick, high priming binder and filler tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigars is a family owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, with manufacturing and agricultural facilities in Esteli, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed cigar brands include the Perdomo Estate Selection Vintage, the Perdomo Double Age 12 Year Vintage, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary, Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Champagne. Perdomo Bur- Habano Bourbon Barrel Age, Perdomo Lot 23, and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the new Perdomo website at www.perdomocigars.com. And by Aganorso Leaf. Great leaf makes great cigars. Aganorso Leaf stands out because of the distinctive flavor of our Corojo 99 and Criollo 98 seeds cultivated by Cuban agronomists on the best lands in Jalapa and Esteli, Nicaragua. When you smoke one of our JFR, JFR Lunatic, Guardian of the Farm, or Casa Fernandez cigars, you experience the unique taste and aroma that makes Aganorso Leaf special. Smoke one today and enjoy the signature flavor of Aganorso Leaf. And by Tobacolera USA. Tobacolera USA, makers of iconic brands such as Monte Cristo, Romeo and Julieta, H. Upman, Aging Room Cigars, Onyx, Vega Fina, and Henry Clay. Tobacolera USA, great things are happening here. And by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app for your mobile device. Keep up with everything going on Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. It's available on iTunes or Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And as always, all the live streaming for the Primetime Network of Shows is sponsored by Drew Estate, as well as our California studios for the Primetime Show. Well, welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Special Edition 86. Today is Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. This is Will Cooper. I am on the red stage. That's correct tonight. The red stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina at the Podomo Studios. And I'm joined cross country by my friend and colleague at the HF Barcelona Studios, Mr. Bear Duplissy. Oop. How are we doing tonight? I'm doing well. How about you? Well, let's see. It's about 37 degrees, uh, which I will absolutely take, man. I'm using my heater tonight, you know, and you were you were asking me about, you know, because some stuff had going on today and you're like, man, are you, are, you, are you good to go for the show? I was like, heck yeah, I'm not missing this. It's my first chance to use my heater since like February. Right. Because, you know, it's been, an, you know, it's been like a sauna in my in my studio for, you know, the last few months because, it, oh yeah, it's Texas. and Right. So um, I I'm 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 fantastic, my friend. I've got a little bit of a little bit of hot tea here. I'm gonna have some water. I'm gonna smoke a fantastic one of my favorite cigars tonight. To, oh yeah, and talk to some great dudes too. Like this is uh, this is winning. It's like it's like it was my birthday yesterday or something. Yeah, wasn't it? That's right. Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> it's like the birthday celebrations gone from like uh, Sunday night. We started celebrating Bur- Bear's birthday. We had a little bit of the pregame going into his birthday. Now tonight we have the little postgame going out um, for, you know, you're still in your 30s, Bear. So, you know, relish it is what I'm going to tell you. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because yeah, it, 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 you know, it, that's a, it's a great age. And, 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 and it was a little Jacob's birthday a couple of days beforehand. So, that's you know. Right. Yeah. Big happy because I was I was there. Well, maybe like two days before the birth or a day before the birth. The day before, you were there yeah. the day before, and it was weird because we you know we're in Texas and and like we we you know we, people ask me how can you do a show. I said, well, his wife's about to give birth any minute. It may not be the best <laughs> thing to have a guest book that night, you know, or or prep for a show. So, um, you know, so I can't believe that's been a year already as well. I mean, so a whole calendar yeah. year has passed with that. 
Well, and one of the the, 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 the saddest footnotes of that whole story is, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I know you like a good burger as much as anybody. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I could have done the I could have done the stereotypical thing and taken you to uh, some really good barbecue, which we're going to do next time. Uh -huh. um, but uh, but, you know, Twisted Root, you know, unfortunately, is a is a covid casualty, man. They declared no bankruptcy. way. Yeah. The burger joint Permanent took you to permanently. Yeah, or I mean, that was well, I, I mean, the. the they the one the one that I took you to is not been open since like April. Yeah. Oh, April May. that's horrible. Yeah, it really stinks. That was my birthday spot. You know, we went there specifically because I know you like a good burger, and right. that's where I usually celebrate my birthday. But we figured, you know, hey, you know, our Jacob's going to be born any minute, so we probably won't get my uh, my annual tradition of going to Twisted Root for my birthday. And right. And uh, so that ended up being the last time. So I will I will take it bittersweet, but I'll take it, man. Uh, got to got to spend it with you. Uh, you know, day later, I got to welcome in uh, my second son, and yeah, man, and you know, yeah. all good. Yeah, no, that's good, excellent. And uh, we have, you know, today was another birthday too. Tom Lazuka was born on the same day as me too, and then, so, but today, yes, oh yeah, Tom, today. oh Tom Lazuka, that's right, yeah. But yes, today was another birthday. Uh, you know, let's stop talking about you know amateur hour with me. I mean, we had a legend that was born today on the twenty seventh. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You talk about a legend. Uh, the uh, you know this guy. He's he, I talked to him. He's halfway around the world in Macedonia. Uh -huh. I, honestly, I talked to him, and I'm ashamed to say this more to my own kids who don't live at home, and more to my parents. So, and I, that's that's my bad, not his fault. That's my fault because I don't talk. I I, I don't make enough. But but uh, that's Jose Blanco. So ha happy. Um, I'm not going to say his birthday, but um, he, <laughs> he's young at heart. <laughs> the Is that professor, a, man. The, the professor. professor. Meet the professor. Yeah. So happy birthday to Jose Blanco. So before we kind of just we're going to welcome in our guests, I want to make sure because because uh, we do have some folks in here tonight. Um, I want to talk about today's uh, Tobacco USA contest giveaway. So folks. I'll mention it throughout the show a few times what it is, but fo folks who are in now, uh, you can get in on the fun right now. We're giving away tonight a, uh, and I want to just say, well, let me just kind of talk about the brand first. And, and tonight's segment is brought to you by Tobacco R USA, who bring to you the new Vega Fina 1998 cigar. It's a brand released originally in Spain and is now available in the U.S. market. Vega Fina 1998 celebrates two decades of the Vega Fina brand, and it features a five-country blend incorporating three-year-old aged tobaccos from Ecuador, Indonesia, Colombia, Nicaragua, and the Dominican Republic. And tonight's is a Vega Fina prize pack we have. Um, so what we have is, for starters, we have a set of wireless earbuds, Vega Fina branded wireless earbuds which I'm newer, I'm, I'm learning now, you need these on the newer iPhones. They're, so they're Bluetooth and you got a full Bluetooth set to go do that. And- um, Right, there's no, there's no jack anymore. My wife had to find out the hard way on that. I, I, don't, I did too, so don't feel bad. Um, so you get that, you get a, um, a Vega Fina branded lighter. So this is a, I don't have jet fuel in it, but a nice, this is a nice sturdy lighter. And, um, you get a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, branded, uh, branded with Vega Fina. So, um, you know, you could, um, uh, I actually, um, I actually, it's Joseph Carr, Josh Sellers, this comes from. Um, so, you oh, know, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I any, like, what's the, what's the year on, what's the year on it? What's the vintage? Um, it, <laughs> it doesn't say <laughs> 1998. <laughs> no, it doesn't say seriously. So, and I know we have, we have a wine expert coming on too, but, um, sure. but I'm going to trust Raphael and Diana from uh, tobacco or you say that they're not going to put uh, junk in it. So you get that price set. All right. In a nice Vega Fina gift box, you'll get right. All you need to do. Okay. Is tell me, okay. The Vega Fina 1998, what country was it originally released in? OK, I just said it and then you can Google or go on to Cigar Coop and get the answer. Put the answer in the chat that you're watching on the Cigar Coop page. Put the answer in the chat. Hashtag Vega, V-E-G-A, F-I-N-A, 1998. And I'll pick one winner at random. Please, folks, if you're entering and I contact you as a winner, 
get back to me. Like, you know, after 24 hours, I'm going to give the prize out to someone else. So, um, and I have pick up your damn phone. (laughs) Look, all you got to do, you'll be contacted by in the, in this chat, you'll, you'll see a response and you'll have a Facebook, uh, direct messenger. So you're getting contacted two ways. If not, I have to give the prize to the next person um, because we do have to get these out. And uh, Diana over at uh, at uh, Tobacco Area USA is great about getting that, but we want to get that. So um, the last one I had to go through, I, it was number the third person ended up getting it. So two people did not get back to me, which I was shocked on. So it went to the third person. So I was a little surprised about that. So, so please get back to me because I know a lot of folks have entered again, the win the Vega Fina uh, gift pack, just go to the, um, you're in the chat. Tell me what country uh, the Vega Fina 1998 was first released in. I said it a little earlier. And if you forgot, you can go in and um, you can, and you have to hashtag it. I'm already seeing some folks not hashtag Vega Fina. Yeah. 1998. Hashtag Vega, Vega Fina 1998. VGA FINA 1998. Yep. And I'm going to make it a little. Yep. And I see now one in there. And, and, uh, there we go. We, an I, see, I see some answers, but you may have, um, it's what country it was released in first. That's the, that's the trick. So be sure to check. This is a little tougher question than, that we've done in the past. But, uh, and I'm going to say Vega Fina is a brand that's done very, very well on the history of Cigar Coupe. Um, including a couple years ago, they had an, they, they made the podium as the number three cigar with the uh, Seven Años, Anya Hedo. So uh, they, they, uh, they, yeah, that was like the surprise of your list that year. It was a surprise of the list, but you know what? Who else had that? You know, you know, some of the big names had that cigar ranked too. Um, Aaron had it in his top 10. And Charlie Minato on Half Wheel had it in his top 10. So it wasn't quite from left field totally, but there were people that really – I think that's the best cigar Alta this has released um, probably in the last five years or so. I mean, they, they have some really good releases, but that Vega Fina for the value you got for that cigar, it was like under, under seven bucks. I mean, you couldn't beat it. But all right. So we got that, we got that out of the way. Um, with, without for, now I'm seeing some people some activity in the room guys good I love it so let's let's welcome in tonight's very very special guest um he's making his debut on the Tuesday show on the special edition side of the house we had him on um Thursday uh, probably almost maybe it was almost two years ago um but without further ado I want to welcome in we want to welcome in the great Tony Bellotto, La Barber Cigars and Lost and Found Cigars. Tony, welcome back to Primetime. Hello, gentlemen. Happy birthday, Bear. How are we doing? Thank you, sir. We are, we are doing stupendous, and uh, we're so excited to have you on uh, on the Tuesday show, man. This is uh, this is fantastic. So you're a little. Le- I think you're a little less than a year older than me. I think mm-hmm. you were. I'm September 6, nineteen eighty four. Right, you're right. Eighty three, right? Oh my. Yes, God. this is. This is the this the same discussion that I had on Sunday night when I had John Carney on my show and, and I, like and I remember having this discussion when I had you on LSU from our takes too. I was like, well, John Carney's the VP of sales for a pretty prestigious cigar company. You have your own cigar company, and then I always every birthday that passes, I sit there and wonder like, well, uh, but my good friends John and Tony, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? Oh, <laughs> But you, hey, you've you've recently you've recently uh, made a credible investment. You've purchased a home. Yes. Now is this first home, like actual home? It's my first house. I I had a okay. condo before, um, like a townhome kind of thing, where okay, everything was you. sort of taken care of. Um, so I just yeah, I got out of there. I moved in on, in, <laughs> I moved in here on Monday and I've been rain and mud for. 10 days, eight days, something like that. So, but yeah, it's my first house. I already got a leaf blower. I'm excited about that. There you go. I was going to say that. What, what was the first purchase for, uh, for the house? Did there be a power tool of some kind? Yeah. I bought a drill and I bought a, and I bought a, a leaf blower. My dad swears by this battery powered one, um, instead of a gas powered one. So I went with it. So we'll see how I haven't used it yet. I've been busy, but we'll see if I can blow some leaves around this week. Echo or steel or what's the brand? It's a Ryobi. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. For as far as battery or upgrade stuff. Yeah. Good, they good they had them on sale at the Home Depot. So I had to pick them. They were like 30% off. So there you go. It It's official. Tony is a homeowner. Coop, I bet you remember your first leaf blower, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I hired the guy. To, uh, he was very, very. <laughs> okay, so I'm the world's worst homeowner. Okay. I should not be a guy who owns a home because I cannot do anything like mechanical or lawn related without screwing it up. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm like, I know at some point when I get into the older senior citizen days, I'm going to have to move into a, some sort of a managed place because I am not going to be able to handle it. Um, to be, I'm the least handy. Like I told my wife, you're marrying one of the least handy people around. She is much more handy than I am. I mean, this is, that's total honesty there. I at least can parallel well, you, park, but but yeah. <laughs> You're handy behind the wheel, Coop. Yeah, that's well. So what about you? Like, so all kidding aside, are you like are you handy around the house? Like, are, like are you excited to start fixing things? No, absolutely not. I mean, if I tell you, um, I need to. I, everything's contracted out that I need, or or my boys do it. I, I'm terrible. Um, it to work. Now the lawn, the lawn. I, I'll be honest. I can probably push a lawn mower. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna. But with my travel schedule, it, to get a lawn going, um, it just it, 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 my lawn would be a disaster, right? So I, I do have someone do my lawn, and uh, he does. It, it's someone. Actually, it's my very good friend uh, who lives next door, actually, and he does an amazing. His 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 lawn is amazing. So now my lawn looks equally amazing. That's good. Fine. Uh, you just have the neighbor doing. Well, what yeah. Well, you, Tony, he, you... He, he may be listening. He's a great guy. So I hired another guy, and he's like, he's like, Will. He goes, I'm here. And I'm like, I don't want to take advantage of the friendship or anything. And, but, but finally, I said, okay, I needed a guy, and, and he says, and he's been great. I mean, his lawn looks it looks as immaculate as his. That's awesome. What about Tony? What about you? Are you excited to to fix things? Are you handy? Or yeah, I mean, I'm an only child, man. So I used to. Uh, like and my parents partied a lot. They still do party a lot. I don't know why I'm saying they partied a lot, but uh, and they would just like leave me at places like in bars or basement, like in the basement of somebody's house. So like I never really had I had toys, but I basically like took them apart and put them back together. So I'm very good at focusing on a task and like on like exploding it and then like putting it back together. So those are the kind of things I like to do. Like sounds like my older son. E- even though. It did like this. I have not lived in a, in a house. My condo was not like a smart condo because I'm really like technology is kind of like eh, for me. So <clears throat> I had like normal light switches and normal stuff like no, like a regular thermostat, regular garage door opener, a regular doorbell. So yesterday it took me two and a half hours to figure out this house came with like a ring doorbell, like a ring alarm and like all these smart the smart stuff so i've been trying to wrap my head around how this all works on my phone so that was a it, it took it literally took me two and a half hours to, to figure out a doorbell yesterday make sure your phone's on silent for the duration of the show otherwise we're going to hear that iconic ring sound every time like the wind blows yeah yeah and the only and the only time that anyone's even come to my house has been me when I'm leaving. So now I just drive down my driveway and it alerts me that there's motion on my front door. So. <laughs> right, right. I mean, exactly. I mean, uh, exactly. I mean, I actually thought when I, you know, when I, when I actually had my house built uh, in New Jersey before I moved here, I thought I was like really cool because I had ethernet outlets put in every room. This is like 2002 when I had that house. So, uh, you know, I thought I was ahead of the game with everyone with that. Um, you know, now you got USB in the walls now. So it's like, you know, go figure. Well, I mean, in 2002, you were ahead of the game. I mean, Coop, that was, you know, not to, oh, I'm not trying to date you or no, make a no. dick or anything. That was 20 years ago. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, you know, it's feel- still relevant today for the, I mean, for the most part, you know. Yeah. You know, so good folks, and I, we built the house in 2002 in New Jersey. Um, that's when my family expanded from like two to four kids very quickly, right? And it was it was a beautiful. I loved that house. I hated where we were in New Jersey so bad. I hated the block we lived on. I hated going traveling up to New York City from where we lived. It was, and you know, it's like like people say, sometimes the juice ain't worth the squeeze. I had to get out of it. I just couldn't. I couldn't take living in New Jersey anymore. So um, it was. And, and I know there's great places in New Jersey. I know there's great people. 
I just, I was just, the people on my block were miserable people. You know, so Tony, is the, new, is the new digs in Youngstown? Yeah, it's actually, it's crazy, man. Cause I'm, I'm a huge fan of like mid-century modern architecture and like real close to us is uh, a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright stuff. And, you know, I love it. And so I've been looking for a house for like three years and I was trying to kind of split the difference between the, the stores and the airport, which are, those are the three places I'm at all the time. And this house popped up in the middle of the woods on it's on eight acres and it's like my dream house. And I'm like, I need to get it, but it's so far away from everything. I'm like 25 minutes from anything. Like there's a McDonald's, but then after that, there's nothing for like 25 minutes. It's, it's insane. Like I am in the middle, middle of no, it's called champion Ohio. So I, it's literally three miles of woods behind me and four or five miles of woods on the wow. other side of me. Wow. So I'm in the country. I'm a country boy now. Not that I wasn't a Midwest country boy before, but yeah, now I'm, now I'm way out here. Wow. wow. That sounds similar to you, right? I mean, because like, you, I mean, you're, well, you're not 25, but you're like 10 minutes away from the city. But if you go 10 minutes the other direction, like it's, it's farmland, right? Yeah. I mean, literally that's how it is. And, in, you know, that's how, I mean, that's how close it is. I'm literally on that line. Um, there's a beltway that goes around uh, Charlotte and I'm on the, just on the outer edge of that beltway. And that when you start hitting the outer edge of that beltway, you're, in, you're in farmland very quickly and you could be downtown. You'll be in Charlotte limits in 10 minutes, downtown in 20 minutes. So, yeah, it's a, you know, Charlotte's not a huge city by any means. All right. It's a huge airport. And my favorite, one of my favorite airports is Charlotte Airport. Well, the problem with the Charlotte Airport is, and it isn't a bad airport by, by airport standards. The only thing that they've screwed up with that airport is they don't have enough seating in that airport. And they, yeah, they, that is true. That is the only thing they've, and, and they built a new, um, they built a new terminal, right? And it, but they didn't put enough seating in that terminal either, but it's, it's, it's spread out enough. It's, um, I think there's probably plenty of seating today. I was gonna um, say, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, you know, so they, I, I, I haven't, like I said, I haven't flown since, um, wow, I haven't flown since TPE. I came back TPE because I drove down when I went to the DR, I, I drove to Florida, so TPE was the last flight I took. Go figure. All right, so that was Tony, my last. That was actually my last flight too. Actually, now that I think about it. Well, there was a, well, I shouldn't say it. it was my last flight out of Charlotte. I did fly to the DR in Nicaragua, but I did those from Miami. So, yeah, the, the, my last flight was coming back from Nicaragua in February. And, and Tony, I don't know. I don't know what there were people who were at TPE who got there was a there were people who went down sick at TPE. A lot oh, of dude, I going. was I was so so the, our whole crew was out. Yeah, when we got back and it was I mean, we, it was bad. <clears throat> so I'm, I, you know, we didn't even think it was here then, but I, I think that I had it back then because I had all the, we, all of us had all the symptoms of it. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people were saying is, um, I know the dojo guys got sick. There were a couple of other companies and they said it wasn't that they just got sick. They had the, they had the symptoms of, of what it was from being sick, you know, of COVID. So it wasn't, you know, how I didn't get it was a miracle considering my history. I, and I went to, and I went to the DR and Nicaragua after that. So I don't know. I something, you know, I lucked out. Uh, but uh, but Tony, great to have you here tonight. Um, for folks who may not, uh, we'll just go quickly into your background. Tony, what was your background before you kind of uh, founded La Barber Cigars and got into Lost and Found? What was your background originally? So originally, um. My dad has owned three retail stores in Ohio f since 1972. So I kind of grew up in this, in the cigar world. Um, I went to college. Uh, I was, I was a bookie in college and I was like the only Italian American in, in, <laughs> when I, where I went to school. So they all, th and I'm from Youngstown. So they all thought I was in the mafia. So I kind of capitalized on that. <laughs> um, alleged, alleged mafia. We, we, we say on the Italian side, but go ahead. <laughs> right. Right. But, so, um, so I would run around and, and take sports bets. And then I would have guys over to the house to play poker and craps. I had like a basically a casino in my house. So 
they would come over and then on Sundays I would uh, cook them dinner like red sauce and then we would um, smoke cigars and drink wine all night. Mm. So in college is when I kind of fell in love with wine. So after I graduated from college, um, I went to, I was working for my dad and I, he wanted to like add something, some f- kind of flavor to the store. So it wasn't just a regular cigar store. And I had the idea to add uh, beer and wine and a beer and wine portfolio to the, the stores. So I kind of started like feeling out what I, what I could do to put to build a nice wine program in the store. And then I, I fell in love with the Argentinian Malbec. I remember this guy brought it in and that was kind of like when I realized that I could taste things in wine. So I started like researching all this stuff and I'm like, where can I learn more about wine? Blah, 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 blah. And I found out that in Cleveland, Ohio, there was um, a lady named Marianne that taught a WSET certification program, which is kind of like, it's a stepping stone to a master of wine program. It's, it's kind of the um, other school of thought compared to the small, like the master sommelier program. Um, instead of being completely service-based, which the, the court of sommeliers is, we're more, the WSET is more um, like history, viniculture, viticulture, um, rules, laws, etc. cetera, uh, in addition to a big blind taste at the end. Um, anyway, so I did that for uh, eight years, I think, six, eight years. Um, I passed with merit. So I passed within the top 2% of anybody that has ever taken the test, which was kind of cool. And then uh, from there, I was work- I put the wine and craft beer program into the stores. And uh, I met, you mentioned Tom Lazuka's birthday earlier. And he was a salesman for Camacho at the time. And Tom was at the house. He used to sleep on my dad's, in my dad's spare bedroom. He was my dad's salesman. And we were sitting and having dinner one night. And he's like, you went to wine school? And I'm like, yeah. And he was kind of like, have you ever thought about sort of using what you know about wine and implementing it to cigars? And he and I said, no, like, I would love to do that. And he said, well, there's a kid that's kind of like the same speed as you in Miami named Robert Caldwell that uh, is super into art like you and super into his palate. And he has a, we start we're starting a cigar factory down there. So that's how I was introduced to Robert. Um, I started blending cigars at Wynwood uh, using tobacco from uh, Camacho uh, or it was actually CLE at the time because they had uh, went, sold that and started over again. Uh, so we were using tobaccos from Honduras, Nicaragua. Um, I was going back and forth to Miami a lot. And then we started producing La Barba Red, which was our first one in uh, Honduras in 2000. 12 i think uh from there um you know we had strikes and gutters along the way and i met Hunt, uh, henderson venture in 2014 um when robert was coming out with caldwell cigar company and i was going down with robert to dr all the time with henderson and we finally in 2014 i think we moved production full-time to tobacco lara william ventura and since then we've been off to the races yeah, and Tony, I remember I remember those early days and kind of how I discovered you guys is I, I think I learned at uh, it was one of the trade shows that cr- this is the time that Christian Aroa had just kind of relaunched and he kind of had relaunched and, and you guys, I believe, were the first contract brand to, to be taken on. So that was an interesting story in itself. Um, and then kind of learning about you and Craig's background, Craig Rossi's background. I remember this was just a very interesting thing. And, and even smoking those original reds, uh, great cigar. Um, so, um, you know, but I do remember those days too. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that was when you, you know, you were one of the first, you were one of the first people to reach out to me about it. And you were, I think one of my first press releases. And I think you were the, like the first person that I talked to because I couldn't afford a trade show booth. So right. I was going as a retailer and then after after hours, after we'd get done work on the trade show floor, I would go to the circle bar and all the bars and hand out my cigars to everybody and, yeah. you know, do the, the social thing and just try to launch the brand. 
and you were and I and I always tell you this, but I'll always remember that you were the you were the first one to pay any attention to my little my little cigar brand, man. So I always will appreciate that. No, no, and, and that was my pleasure. You know, but we sometimes when we look for new brands, you know, we really try to find some some intangibles and some some factors. And it was clear this is 2012, 13, that there was something more than just a contract brand here. Um, like I said, with your background, just what you guys came up with for the original La Barba Red, uh, we, we sensed what was to come, I think. We, there was a good feeling with that, too. So you guys were you guys were definitely um, – and you guys were great to us, so, like, to me. I was still new at the time, too. So you were great back to me at the time, which I appreciated as well. So, Tony, something I've always wanted to ask you about uh the transition from moving from honduras to the dominican did it feel like going home when you when you started uh, manufacturing your cigars in the dominican because you grew up your your dad uh, you, is is a huge fan of fuente you grew up with you know like that cameroon um uh, in your you know in your you know in your face all Bloodstream, day long and yeah. everything yeah <laughs> and, and dominican tobacco was certainly a backbone of that too and everything did it feel did it feel a lot like going home when you when you when you signed on with the with william it's it's funny it's funny that you mentioned that because we we were you know previously we we're talking about this house so you know i was going and seeing all these houses three or four a day and you know in the market today i was making like i would call my realtor and i'd be like i like f- these four houses can we go see them in the morning and then she'd call me at like eight and be like, they're all under contract. Right. So it's like all these houses are selling it. And I I really was like, kind of at that point, like just like trying to get a house. Like I didn't really give a shit what it, what it was going to be. And that was bad. So then I kind of slowed down and was like, okay, I'm not even going to look if something happens and it feels like home, then I'm buying it. And I'm going to make an offer as soon as I, as soon as I see it. And that happened. And I, it's been like two or three years I've been looking for a house. And that happened with this house. I saw it. Somebody had shared it on Facebook and I saw it and I called her immediately. I'm like, I need to see this house at five o'clock. I got in. There was already four offers on it. I walked in. I'm like, this is my house. It feels like home. I know it for 100 sh- percent sure. I made an offer that day with like an escalation clause up to a certain amount of, of money because I, that's how bad I wanted it. So to answer your question, Absolutely. The first time I was there with Henderson and Rob, I was like, this is where this needs to happen. Just because not only because of the venture of family, but because of the tobaccos that we were tasting because of Leo Reyes and all of these guys that we, we buy our tobacco from, it was like, it felt right. It felt like it fit. And, it, and I don't know if that's always a, a great thing, but it's kind of my thing. So, and that's been our thing since the beginning with down and back and Caldwell cigars, lost and found on La Barba is like, we're it's friends first and business second. And I think that we, we always react uh, with that in mind when we, when we make any business decision as a team. Uh, and I think that that's helped us a lot uh, along the way and in, in our journey to kind of, um, mark you know make our mark in in the cigar industry yeah and you know you mentioned leo race um i had a chance at pro cigar i went on the race tour um and i got to go to the farm and leo well he doesn't really speak a lot of english that guy is we got a clinic on tobacco growing from that guy Um, i've never he's such a proud he is so proud of his tobacco oh yeah yeah and he's proud he he still incorporates like he was saying, I'm not saying he does everything old school, but he still some of the farms he has are very much run old school, like like the way they are 50 years ago. And um, he's very proud of that, too, especially with some of the tobacco that comes out of there. Um, so and I remember even when I came back from Pro Cigar, we had a we had Charlie Minato on. And, and it was my first pro cigar. And he said, hey, what tours did you go on? And I said, I went on the race tour. And, and he was like, man, that's what the most underrated tour out there um, because of what they take you through on it. And, and I said, yeah, I, I was blown away by what um, what what they presented to us. Yeah, he's he's an incredible guy. And, you know, for us, we got we got kind of lucky, but, you know, more so, I think that he's got kind of the same ethos that we do and how he operates his business. But we we've got the excuse me, really rare opportunity to 
grab some awesome tobaccos off of him because uh, of our attitude and the size of our company, you know, because he was growing. So for example, the King is dead as Negrito tobacco. And right. at the time, nobody was really using it because Leo was growing it and it was so small. The farms were so small, but we were so interested in those kind of things. And the same with his older, uh, like the first one and only uh, that came out was 15 years. The tobacco itself was 15 years old. And the reason we called it one and only, and the reason we still do is because that was the rest of that tobacco. And he was super excited when we um, we started working with him because we were using these like La Barba Purple has that Carbonell tobacco in it. Yeah. And he's super proud about that. And, you know, we were reaching production c- capacity on that cigar continuously, but which is, I think, a good thing. But we have access to a lot of tobaccos that a lot of people don't because of one, our size and because of two, the relationship we have with him and Henderson. Yeah, and you're, and you're very right because of that whole connection with Henderson, you and Caldwell, the, the two tobaccos you mentioned, Carbonell and Negrito, uh, you guys, like I said, made them cool. You guys, you guys made it cool. You guys said, hey, we can work with this and make some really good blends out of out of these uh, cigars, and, and there's no question about it. Um, I think you guys really kind of, if you, if you and we're going to talk about some of the trend setting for sure that you guys were involved with this past decade. That was a big part of it from a tobacco end. Uh, you know, some of the products you brought to market with that and I have brought to market have been exceptional with that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, so Bear and I, I think we're both smoking the same cigar right now. We're, mm-hmm. sm- we're smoking the, uh, the Ricochet. Um, and crew, me- crew makes the soul. Crew make- I-, I had to go double check that I was going to say it right because I've said it wrong. But uh, this week, so yeah, it's uh, yes, exactly. The crew makes us all. Um, and here's what's interesting, Tony. I'm gonna be, I'll be transparent. So I remember I got this cigar from you at the trade show, right? The worst thing you can do is smoke a cigar at the trade show. It, oh, yeah. It's it's the worst thing that you can do. So I smoked it and it did nothing for me, right? But it was because my palate was shot. Because a few weeks later, I don't, I think Bear, it was you. It was, we had both lit this up like separately. And I think Bear and mm-hmm. I both came back to each other and said, hey, did you guys smoke that Crew Mexico Soul again? I'm like, Bear, it's like night and day because you shouldn't smoke a cigar at the trade show is what we found. And we we both really liked the cigar a lot. So I know it was, it was um, you know, sometimes we, we our palates are shot or we're just distracted. But but uh, this has been a tremendous uh, pack, uh, blend for you guys. Um, it's the fourth regular production line, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell us red, what- purple. Yep. Uh, orange, which is the San Andres, and then the, the Mexi Soul. Yep. So talk a little about this cigar. What is Crew Mexi Soul exactly? <clears throat> so that has a Mexican sun-grown wrapper on it. It's a Mexican sun-grown Habano wrapper, um, which was kind of cool because we, we, we saw a lot of, you know, Mexican Maduro wrappers coming out. <coughs> and we were lucky enough, excuse me, to find to find this wrapper uh, in the quantities that we needed it in. Um which I thought was very cool because the ricochet line in itself was kind of um, I wanted it to kind of go back to my roots in in wine uh, more so than the red and the purple did. So I, I like the Mexican tobaccos and that they are all have that like real earthy kind of minerality to them. Um, And that one does, especially, and and to your note about the, the trade show, I've all, I've always said that, especially because you have a cigar that, that goes from, you know, 80 to 90% humidity in the Dominican Republic. And we're all, you know, they're, we're all getting, trying to get them yeah, yeah. Uh, to the show as soon as possible. And then you go from that to they're sitting in uh, Las Vegas, dry heat. Uh, they've traveled on a plane, you know, and it, it, wine, you call it bottle shock. So I, I always right. call it cigar shock, right. but there's something about traveling with cigars that, that they don't like the cigars they, just they, don't they, like it. They don't. And, and that's why, like, I know I stopped reviewing trade show cigars a few years ago um, for that reason. Um, it gives us a, like at the same time, you always want to get a We like to smoke it because we want to get a, a feel for it. But sometimes the cigars for whatever reason or but sometimes it's also us who are who are burnt out from smoking that week as well. So I don't yeah. want to all blame it on that because, I, you know. Some people do, you know, I'm sure you guys tried your best there on it. But like I said, when I went back, different, I think Bear and I had a very different, I don't know what Bear's experience was like at the show. Mine was, mine was like, 
I need to, you know, I wasn't, you know, it didn't do anything for me, but going back and smoking that and on a clean palate, know the story there. Yeah, I think my, my first experience with it um, wasn't, wasn't, uh, um, wasn't as uh, polar opposite as, as yours, Coop. Um, I, that I could, I tasted what I, I tasted, the, this is sound so obnoxious. I'm sorry, Tony. I tasted the potential. That, we, and yeah. I was I, like, I like that. I like that. that. So that's what women tell me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I t- and I, I was, I was really anxious. I was actually really anxious to get this after the trade show. So there were a lot of, there were cigars that year that I was really excited about. Um, but this was, this honestly was one of them that I really wanted. I sought out and uh, was able to get uh, what you call the, the Coronita, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the Petit Corona. Corona. Yep. yep. Um, and I started smoking those and was just really impressed with not only the, the, the spice that came off the wrapper, um, like you, you mentioned the minerality, but that cigar in that particular, in the, in the, in the Petit Corona specifically is incredibly rich. Yep. There's some really, really deep, rich flavors to it. Some beautiful sweetness. And then, um, and then I came, I went over to, I changed over to the, uh, to the Grand Robusto, um, which I've been, uh, been happy to procure some of these from, from, yep, from your store. Uh, you, yep. you've been kind, uh, kind enough to, to help me out with that. And then, uh, and, uh, and then I asked you just, this was actually just a few weeks ago. I said, you know, I haven't had a chance to just, can uh, the torpedo can, can we throw some of those in the next, uh, the next order? And you said, absolutely. So you sent me a few of those and that's what I'm smoking tonight. And, uh, uh, everybody knows uh, I'm not a torpedo guy. Um, just I'm very picky when it comes to them. I'm a huge Vitola snob. Um, and the richness isn't as there as, as it is with the Petit Corona, but there are so many other nuances that I like with the torpedo. I think the Grand Robusta is still my favorite size, um, but like every single one of the Vitolas really offers something different. And, but the, 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 the positives at each of those Vitolas don't take away from like the overall, like the overall foundation that you built in the blend, I think. Yeah. Um, I think that's a perfect way you said that. And you mentioned the minerality in here. It compliment, it, it is a compliment to the overall flavor profile. Like some people hear a mineral component and they get a little, that is not the case. This is just delivering a well-balanced smoke, which is just really, um, it's lighting up my palate. Um, as I'm smoking it. So I agree with you on that bear. So Tony, let's talk about that because I've, 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 for, for a second, um, you know, Coop, I think you bring up a really good subject. So Tony, since you have such the, you know, out of the three of us, you have the most sophisticated palate, uh, at least well-trained and well-educated talk about like those, those buzzwords that we hear, like you, you from a, you know, you and I work in the retail sector. There are certain words that you don't use to the layman consumer. You never, you never say acrid. You never say acidic. You never say bitter. But there, these are three very key flavor components when you talk about a well balanced blend. And and minerality kind of goes into that that grouping of like negative connotation. But but talk about the importance of 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 it, how it can lend to balance. Well, you know, I think that there's a couple of points I want to touch on with that. <clears throat> so for me. You know, I'm not I try to not be afraid of of those words, you know, and I try to because I think they're very important. It's a very important part of understanding what's going on in in a cigar. And if you avoid it, then you end up having a cigar that's out of balance. Right. Because you're if you're mentally not thinking about it and it's not coming out of your mouth, then you're not going to adjust the parameters appropriately. So I was talking to a winemaker a while ago. Um, and he was telling me about balance. And I think that's, that's key in, um, wine making and cigar making is balance because you never want, you never want anything to be too over the top. Right. So <clears throat> he was telling me, and this is, a, uh, this was kind of like a game changer for me. Cause I'd never thought about it this way, but he said, you know, alcohol, tannin and fruit are like the three things that hold up a curtain rod. And if any of them are uneven, then the curtain is going to fall off. And it was kind of like, whoa, like this guy 
said something stupid that is really intelligent. And I think the same goes for cigars. If you, if you have something that's too, you know, I look at it from a standpoint of you have balance, you have body and you have strength. And I think if any of those three things are out of kilter, then the whole thing falls apart. So using that, so tasting the tobacco with a little bit of minerality in it, you want to, you want to kind of compare or contrast those flavors. And I, and I think contrasting them in, in, a, in, with minerality is more appropriate than not. So I try to use tobaccos that had a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of that uh, like graham cracker kind of idea to them to kind of balance out that almost, you know, um, gravelly kind of thing that's going on with it. And I think that it works well. And I think that you just pointing out to yourself or to somebody else that that component's there and then be able to balance your way out of it is, is kind of key to making a great, a great flavored and tasting complex, balanced medium bodied cigar. hundred percent. So like Coop, I don't know what you're getting out of your Vitola cause I know you're smoking a different one, mm-hmm. but like, you know, like that was, we were talking about, I was talking about the different Vitolas and like in the Petit Corona, like the, the richness that I get is like some really, um, really dark fruit sweetness. The dark fruit, like the peach, that peach type of sweetness. Almost. Yeah. Stone, stone, stone fruit, fruit. Like yeah. really, yeah, yeah, really. Now in this torpedo, it, the sweetness kind of, it, it, there's still a little bit of that. There's kind of like the nuanced and the fruitiness but i get more baking spice like i get more a little bit more cinnamon a little bit more ginger a little bit more mut nor more nutmeg whoa goodness gracious more nutmeg um and but that again that that minerality um kind of brings it brings all of the as i was talking about the differences in all each vitola they, it kind of brings it all home it about like you said it balances it out and uh and to a just a really really enjoyable enjoyable blend like in yeah. each and every vitola and i'm a huge vitola snob i really am um i ha- um there's one size left right tony I, the gordo right yeah six by 60 okay so that's uh, that's the next one on my list i need it's to- funny it's funny that you mentioned that because with with most of our stuff like there's a there's a key filler component that is kind of the outstanding thing and you know for the purple it's carbonyl for the red it's uh, on hybridized corojo there's like a, a component in every one of the filler that that kind of is makes, and I'm going to say outstanding, but I'm going to mean it the way it should be. Like it, it's an outlier. It's, it stands apart from the rest of the tobaccos. Um, and in that, in that cigar in particular, it's Pennsylvania broadleaf. And I think that when you, so you're, you're translating, you know, Pennsylvania broadleaf is a very potent tobacco. Mm-hmm. And in that small like package in the Coronita, it's going to shine through big time. And we use about the same amount of it all the way up to the six by 60. And the key to that is, you know, blending. So we want, we want the Vitolas to taste differently, but we want to have them kind of have the same idea behind them. And I think that that broadleaf tells the story very nicely. And like you said, when with the Coronita, you're getting more of that dark fruit, um, and it dissipates as you get in the bigger ring gauges. But my job is to make sure that we, as that dark fruit component dissipates, we have to add different tobaccos to kind of, and in more quantities to, to bring up the other balance components for the bigger ring gauges. So Tony, I'm, I'm, this is a completely selfish question. Yeah. Uh, and I know, I know palate is very subjective, but some of my observations like, how, how do you feel about them? Do you feel like they're they're pretty close to the way, the way you feel, or do you think they're? Do you think I'm? No, like, I think they're spot on. No, I think okay. they're spot on. You know, and I think and palates are subjective, but at the same time, like a, you know, I always talk when I talk about wine. I always make this comparison when I talk about cigars, is you know when you taste green apple in a white wine, there's a reason for it, and the reason for it is because you're tasting the same chemical that you taste in a green apple. So although a pal- your palate is very subjective, like those certain chemicals trigger certain responses that make you think of those things. So you have to have kind of like this Rolodex of different flavors in your head, right? But if, you have ever, if, you've, if you've eaten a green apple before 
and then you taste white wine with that same component in it, it reminds you of green apple, but it may not taste the same to somebody else. It's just having that, that comparison or that sort of rollback where you can say, okay, like this is uh, malic acid, which is why things taste like green apples, right? This is malic acid. I could taste that. Um, and then when you have a Chardonnay that tastes buttery, for example, it's because they force what's called malolactic fermentation. And that's changing the malic acid, which is in the green apples, into lactic acid, which is in butter and milk, right? So mm -hmm. you taste the buttery Chardonnay, it's because you're tasting that lactic acid. And I think that, you know, palate wise, people try to reach sometimes and not. And I think the simplest, what is that, Occam's razor, right? That the mm -hmm. simplest answer is usually the right one. And I think that that's very important in cigars as well as you, as you whatever you actually think is what you should just say. And that's usually right around the right answer. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm very humbled right now. So <laughs> that's um, so Tony, the, the, the last thing about the Mexican, uh, the Mexican sun grown wrapper that I want to ask about is when you were um, when you were tasting these tobaccos and they, and they, and they put the Mexican sun grown in front of you and said, Hey, I've got this really unique tobacco. You should take a look at it. It's Mexican sun grown. Did you, did you do the same double take that we all did when you handed us the cigar? Uh, when you said Mexican sun grown and like most of us, like the, because the, the purple plays a trick on you because if you take the band off, the wrapper isn't very dark, but with the, the label on, it seems darker. Right. So like did, uh, when you first told us, that, I was like, oh, he must've meant Mexican Maduro. Like, like he just, the, the you know, the, that's what he probably meant. But did you do the same double take, the proverbial double take, when when they said, "Here, here's Mexican sun grown." Uh, for me, my personality is I'm like, "That's dope. Let's do it," and I just picked it up and started smoking it. So, I mean, that's that's kind of like where, you know, I'm like, I've never heard of that before, and I think that that's kind of our another one of our sort of ethos mission statements is like never rule anything out before, you know, you you taste it or experience it, and I think that that's kind of uh, important in all things, right? Right. Yeah. I, I was like to, to answer your question I was like I'm like I did double take it because I'm like what you know like what is that I've never seen that I've never heard of this so it was kind of like a double take in that where I was like super intrigued and then I was like how can we work with this so we kind of you know with purple we worked around carbonyl because I was so interested in that tobacco so we built the cigar around the filler and with Mexi Soul we built the cigar around the wrapper and in it, it I don't know if there's a right way or wrong way to do it because we've kind of just bootstrapped it since we started. And, you know, I was 27 when I made my first cigar. So I like, I'm not, not a, no, I'm not a master blender. You know, I have no, I just wanted something that tasted good. And I still kind of do to this day. I want it to be unique. I wanted it to taste well. And I understand a lot more about tobacco than I did back then and blending. And I think my, I think that the brand and the lines have graduated and you can kind of taste that. And if you taste them, you know, vertically throughout the colors that you can kind of taste that graduation in my palate. And I hope that that people see that and then understand, you know, the direction that I, we're eventually going to get to. So, like in wine, in wine, there's some definitely some great blends. You know, you think about like the super Tuscan um, category and then there's, you know, some other, you know, the other vintages where they blend certain grapes and everything to make to make pretty good wine but for the most part uh, if we're com comparatively speaking wines are are, are are mostly puros right it's mostly like it's, it's a chardonnay and that's the, that's the grape that's used it's a pinot noir that's the grape that's used etc um you know with that being your background is there is there any desire for you to create a puro cigar to be representative of you know a tobacco that you've really that you've really come to discover and enjoy in this journey? Well, I think, you know, most of the, the general rule is um, you have to have it 80% of that varietal in order to call it um, that varietal. So you have to have at least 80% of the wine has to be Cabernet in order to call it Cabernet. So I think the way that I look at it is with blending cigars, the pure, like a pure thing, like a, like a Bahique, okay? It's 100% Corojo. But I think that with blending cigars, you need a little salt and pepper. 
And I think that's the key is adding those tobaccos to, to balance out the food to, or the food <laughs> to balance out the cigar. You need like that salt and pepper, like a little bit of those spices to kind of round it out. And I think if you have <clears throat> from a level of having a, a purely Dominican cigar, that's all the same varietal, I think it would be kind of like, okay, like here's, you know, a steak with no salt and pepper so it just tastes like, you know, it doesn't bring out the flavors of the steak. Uh, and I think that that's kind of my thought process behind it. Um, I wouldn't be willing to say no. I'm not saying no to it, but, you know, like my favorite wine is Pinot Noir and it's always 100% Pinot Noir. But um, if, if, if it was right and if it was the right cigar, then I, I, don't, I would do it 100%. I think we you know, we talked about this before. Pinot Noir is one of, is uh, is my favorite red as well. Um, I'm a big Yam Hill Valley uh, in Oregon mm-hmm. fan. Uh, all right, what what uh, what's what's your favorite region for Pinot? Willamette. So another Oregon, another Oregon guy myself. I mean, I I love Burgundy, but you know who can afford good Burgundy? Nobody. You know, I think yeah, Romney yeah, Conti is yeah. like fifty six hundred dollars a bottle right now, something like that. Jesus. <laughs> Definitely not in my budget. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm actually the Italian Zinfandel guy as well. And, and and I'm just, as I'm smoking this, I, I absolutely see what you were going for with this. Um, and I'm not as big a wine probably as, as you guys are, but I do like Italian Zinfandel. And, and I, I'm totally getting what you're doing with this. Um, I really like, I, I mean, I can even see smoking this with, with a white wine as well i mean pairing this with a white wine would work really well as well as with a red wine it's it's um it's interesting uh it, it's do you tony do you you know why is it maybe maybe you know the answer to this question but why is it that we don't see more san andreas natural like everyone wants to put that san andreas maduro on it and i have seen people use the san andreas natural but it's it's few and far between and is there any reason why that this is just not used more as a rapper as a rapper and why everyone goes for the maduro uh with it i think consumer i think it's consumer demand okay plain and simple i just think it doesn't have the you know it doesn't have the reputation that the reputation that would over like to surpass the the maduro right you know so i i mean i think maybe we'll hopefully we'll see some more of it and i would like to see more of it in the market and because i think it's a great rapper yeah um, and, and they've taken, you know, over the past, I mean, when was that big San Andres like trade show, like 2015, 2014, when everybody released one, Yeah. Like when, when they finally figured out how to ferment that wrapper. Right. And I think that, you, you know, we're due for, you know, they're, they're doing great things at the, at a lot of those farms in Mexico and they're finally yeah. kind of, uh, getting the premium cigar world. And I'm excited about it because the tobaccos that are coming out of there, are excellent in any form, natural Maduro. Um, do you, do you I'm remember, excited about that. Yeah, Tony, I mean, I know you, you've been, you said you started when you're 27 and you're like, oh, Barbara's eight years old already, right? But do you remember yeah. like going back eight, eight, nine years ago, people didn't want to even say they were using a, a rapper from Mexico. They no, were, not at all. It, it was like, even, it, it was it taboo. Was like, yeah, it was taboo. Yeah. And it was like you said, it was around that 2014 where it became cool to start using the, the Mexican. I remember it was like, I think Pete Johnson with the Mexican experiment was like one of the early ones to use the word Mexico on the cigar, besides like Tiamo, right? But then it just started to become, you know, now we, we take it for now, like people are excited about a San Andres Maduro rapper or San Andres rapper. So it, it was very different back eight or nine years ago, I remember. Well, even eight or nine years ago, it was like there was no, you know, there was very few Dominican cigars that besides the legacies that you were like, oh, you know, like this is like I, I'm interested in this. Right. And I think that 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 was another, you know, for us being a Domin- in the Dominican Republic manufacturing, I think it was another big stepping stone because uh, we're both Robert and myself are very big fans of everything that comes out of Dominican Republic. And it kind of got some shade, you know, from Nicaragua and Honduras from the the early 2000s to 2000, you know, 13 or 14. So 
that was kind of our kind of a goal of ours just to kind of shine some light on on the dr again yeah that, that's it, a really fair point tony yeah. because like you you know you, you know nicaraguan tobacco has been so hot um you know for for a long time i mean we talked about you know how t- mexican tobacco was taboo not too long ago i mean i remember started smoking cigars and when nicaraguan tobacco just you know overall i mean there were a couple standouts but other than that like we said the legacy brands but other than that at the time nicaraguan tobacco just wasn't very good a lot of cigars that were coming out of nicaragua just weren't very good yeah i mean the boom like when during the boom it was like everybody wanted and they called them dominicans like they would come into our store and i was a kid and they'd be like i need some of your dominicans and my dad's like there's a hundred of them like what do you want they're like i just want dominican tobacco i just want dominican cigars yeah and then and then that fell and then nicaragua made it made a play you know in the early 2000s and then i think that 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 brought up like a whole new kind of view on on tobacco and then then we had the mexican kind of revolution quote unquote and then now i think we're getting back to so like the cigar you're smoking has a mexican wrapper an indonesian binder and fillers from nicaragua dominican republic and pennsylvania pennsylvania so it's like you know we're kind of I think one worlding everything and kind of saying, okay, well, these are the things that we don't necessarily, these are the things that are kind of not, I don't, I don't know what the word to use, but not bad about Nicaragua tobacco, but these are like kind of the, the notes that we don't prefer. And these are the notes we prefer about the Dominican stuff. And then you can kind of, you know, equalize into a cigar through different tobaccos and different growing regions. And I think that's, kind of paramount i think i see that as the direction mainly of how the industry is going now is kind of having that you know sort of share our tobaccos around the world kind of thing yeah. are you are you, ahead, are you allowed to just disc- i'm sorry coop I, i've done this a couple times you're fine, you're fine. i apologize not a problem um are you allowed to disclose where you got the wrapper from uh, where you were able to procure this i mean there's only a couple of Mex- mexican uh, tobacco it's Turan. suppliers but yeah, yeah it's Turan. Turan. okay yeah. yeah so i mean they awesome. don't yeah. You, you know, Tony, you talk about Dominican rapper. I mean, when, when Caldwell released uh, Long of the King and then when you re- rebranded the, the Red, I mean, those were two great examples of what Ventura's factory was able to kind of build blends with. We, we, all, we all know what Carlito did for Opus X in the 90s. I mean, that kind of was, was the game changer. But, you know, you guys coming out pretty early in your, in your portfolios, Dominican, really good Dominican Puros, I think was a, was a big statement you guys made. Yeah, I mean that we again got very lucky with Mr. Reyes, and we were offered on hybridized Cuban Corojo, and there's only two people in the world that have it. It's him and Christian. And yeah. you know we translated what we what we knew about Corojo into that, and then from there, you know that that opened the the kind of the floodgate, so to speak. But we did get very lucky in being able to have access to that wrapper. Yeah, because um, I think it is a very special wrapper from from the Dominican Republic. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. Like I said, the stuff, um, and like I said, a, you know, we know it's been used in Nicaragua for, for years, but that is a hybrid seed, and I'm not taking anything away from what, like, other people in Nicaragua have done. They've done a great job with that, but to kind of see, you know, like I said, coming out of the Dominican and doing the same thing that the Aroas did, and it was kind of like, look, I think that was a good transition for you, for you when you rebranded with Barber. It still was a Corojo at heart is what you had, you know, you still right. kind of had a Corojo at heart. You didn't kind of completely, you know, come up with something. It's a different blend. Yes, but it's not, you kept the Corojo roots to it, which I thought was a really good thing. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so let's kind of turn a little bear. Anything else we want to hit on this cigar before we kind of turn on to a couple of the other topics? Uh, no, I just, um, I'm, 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 I know you'll be happy about this. I'm excited about the Gordo because it's the only Vitola I haven't tried in this blend and I've, I've loved every Vitola so far. And I mean, this has a, this is a chance to be a, a Vitola sweep uh, for me, which, you That's, know, uh, yeah. Like and I'm said, in the same, I'm in the same that. boat. I'm in the same boat, but yeah, I mean, when you have three Vitolas that kind of just stand like stand out, that's a strong statement. So like I said, it's a, it's a line where there's something for everybody in here, which I, which is again, something that I like um, because certainly this, Diff- people have different sizes they enjoy as well. Um, so, kind of, yeah. So, La Barber 2020 now, right? Um, quieter year, right? Um, 
obviously this was that the plan all along or did COVID um, and, and lack of a trade show, did that change things uh, with your plan this year to kind of maybe stay the course? No, I mean, my plan, you know, I really want La Barba to, to um, fit into its own seat and I don't want, want it to, you know, I really want to focus on my core lines. You know, I think this year, you know, one of the main changes I'm going to make this year is I'm going to, I think I'm going to expand the, the, Vatolas of, of purple and red and maybe put them in 25 count boxes. But and that's like a world's first announcement coop. Oh wow, there. hey you go. guys. There you oh, go. Thank you. But yeah, but that's that's sort of what you know we've been talking about internally is kind of you know um expanding the Vatola size and maybe changing them to 25 count boxes. Uh keeping keeping the the uh, cafe sizes at 12 count boxes like the Lancero and like the long corona and kind of the specialty sizes to mm -hmm. those 12 counts. But, you know, um, blending Corona, Robusto, Toro um, in red and purple. But I really want I, I, I made I kind of made a decision in 2018 or 20. When did I release Mexi Soul? Is that 18? Last, last 19? year. 19. 19. 19. Wow. Yeah, was 18. So, in 19, yeah. I, so I made the decision then at, at, when, at that show that I was kind of going to be I'm OK with four and I want to really build a core for La Barba so that people understand that my goal is consistency and quality and that I'm only focused on those four cigars. Cause if I grow to eight or 12, you know, I, I don't want to lose the, the quality control and the focus that I could with a smaller core line and really develop those and maybe do like, if I find something fun in the next couple of years, do another one and only, um, I have, I actually have some one and only like sample blends behind me. Um, so if I find something, then it'll, it'll be a one and only if I don't, then there won't. So that's kind of the, the goal for that. I think, you know, we've put, um, and, and coming from then that I still have work to do. Right. So we've kind of switched gears a little bit with loss and found, and that's kind of been our limited, like a, a really big push with loss and found for our limited edition stuff, um, and our charity uh, initiative. So, um, I think that's kind of, um, for new new release wise, I think they're mostly going to stay to to the lost and founds for now and develop just keep developing the core of La Barba and making sure that the cigars are like righteous every time you smoke them. Tony, I do have one uh, coop before we do segue. I do have one yeah. more question about the crew Mexi Soul. So um, and I'm looking at this now, I think almost for the first time in a different maybe just different lighting for the first time. But my question to you, I was going to ask you tonight, Tony, was, you know, you have the La Barba purple, which is a different shade of purple, but the, I've always thought the crew Mexi soul was purple too, but now I'm looking at it. Is it, is it just really dark blue? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a Royal blue. Oh gosh. I'm just a moron then. <laughs> I, All this time I thought you had two purple cigars and I was going to ask you about that, but okay. So it, the other day, it's funny you mentioned that because the other day I watched a documentary on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And by the way, you have to, you guys have to watch it because it's like the most incredible story of like a brand and like the way where this all came from. But to make a long story short, I was watching it and then I was like, holy shit, my cigars are the same colors as there's turtles. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even realize it until I watched the documentary. So there you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Got to round it out and find a green now, Tony. You know, I know. just bring it all home. Right. <laughs> right. You know, it was interesting, Tony, you were um, we're, we're segueing the lost and found. Um, when I was kind of kind of I think I told you that what lost and found did for the cigar industry was my story of the decade. And it was funny that the one I would the other one I was looking at was the kind of San Andreas Mexican coming out of the closet was the other one. It was kind of interesting that that was those I was kind of going back and forth with those two stories as, as like big thing. But but lost and found, Tony, I, I know I mentioned this on the four shot show and I, I want to mention it here. You guys completely changed the game in the industry this decade with what you guys did with that brand. Um, it's not so much like you said, it's not that you guys went out and created these blends, but you made it cool to go out into these factories, find some of the really good blends, package them in such a way that connected with consumers that – and I mentioned it now all the cool kids started doing it afterwards. It's not that you, maybe you guys weren't the first to do it, but you guys were the first to say, this is what you're doing. And I, I you know, I would be remiss if I don't give you guys the credit on that. Um, because it, 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 it was a, it changed, it changed a lot in the industry 
over the past few years. So uh, this is a great job, I want to say, for you guys. Thank you. I, pr- I appreciate that. Yeah. That was, you know, we – I do appreciate that. It humbles. It's humbling. Yeah. No, thank you. Did you guys think that this was going to – like, did you guys ever expect that to happen? Like, okay, you got this concept. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a model that, you know – and you were transparent about the model. Hey, we're, we're not blending these cigars. We're going and getting them from the factory. Did you think it would have the impact it had? Because it definitely, you could be humble about it, but you know that this thing started steamrolling with other companies afterwards. Yeah, I mean, 100%. And no, no, we didn't. Like, it literally started with Robbie bringing me back 50 cigars from Costa Rica. Right. And that was, and I was like, man, these are fucking awesome. Right. And I was like, we can, let's do something with these. And he's like, there's 50 cigars. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, let's put them in like tissue paper or something. Right. I'm like, they're just so good to be like lost forever. Yeah. And is that the peppered cream soda? No, that was called. Uh, what was that called? It was a. It was a like a almost an A size, and I think it was Cuban. Oh, it was. I think it was Cuban tobacco. It, it. They were literally. It was 50 cigars wrapped. Each one was in like yellow tissue paper with like a blue ribbon around it. Lost Reserve, I think it was called, something like that. But that one never even got. That one even never left. I I might have smoked thirty of them. So <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was like I don't even know if anyone ever got them or if someone has one now. If they do, feel free to send it to me <laughs> for free. That yeah. Tony, I remember the one you sent me. You said, "Coop, I got to send you this cigar, right?" And I know these things are very limited to begin with, right? And that was that Stout Corona. And you, you would ne- that style Corona was fantastic. So good, right? It, re- I mean, that cigar, yeah, it was really good cigar. Um, enjoyed it immensely. So, um, but yeah, so it was a huge part. It's been a huge part. Um, and, and I like, I like, I like the fact that you guys both have separated that out from your from your own brands, uh, La Barber and Caldwell. I kind of like the fact that it's a very identifiable brand. And I think the thing that's cool about, and I sometimes, Bear and I talk a lot about gimmicky stuff, right? But I think it's always cool to see what, what you guys come up with to the packaging versus the cigar on there. Um, I, it's a, it, there's a fun aspect to that. So, you know, that's always interesting. What, what, what packaging is, and we'll get into some of the stuff that you guys did this year, which was, which was, which was really cool. Um, but you guys made a decision in 2020 to, you just said more of the focus on, on lost and found. And you guys took a very different angle this year, um, with the whole give a fuck program that you have right now, yep. um, which we can't say on the air guys. So, um, um, what went into kind of the decision-making this year to kind of say, you know what, let's do this and kind of give back to various, uh, organizations and, and the people on, on this, what kind of went into that for your 2020 strategy? So Robbie and I had always talked about it and because we're both, both very sort of conscious of a lot of things that are going on and and just crazy shit that's happening in the world. Right. And this was last year sometime. So 20, like the end of 2018, we started talking about it and we started talking about how we could give back. And then we started like, we started, we were just having a dialogue about, um, you know, giving some money here or giving some thing there and how that never really has an impact because when we go away, then that then that lo- no longer exists. So we, we started talking about creating an entity that <laughs> its purpose is to give back and to help whether or not it's animals, people, we don't give a fuck, right? So it that was kind of the the initial sort of discussions. And then we were kind of planning it out and we have, we have some really cool stuff in the pipeline that have been, we've been working on for like five, like since 2018. So three years, it'll be three or four years by the time this thing happens. So that was our initial kind of concept. And then COVID happened and Robbie called me and he's like, Hey man, like I just, I've been dry. I drove down. I don't know where he was going. He's like, and there was like a line of families outside of this uh, shelter that were they they couldn't afford food and he's like we need to do this right now and he's like i can't believe all these people are waiting in line and aren't going to get fed so uh we kind of like rush off fenced um give a fucking no free lunch and that's where because we had all the cigars ready for all these projects like we had already found them and we were just kind of sitting on them waiting for the right time and he was like we need to he's like we need to 
like do this right now. He's like, I'm going to call Camilla's house. And he's like, we'll start working on the packaging. And uh, I have the cigars for it. I'll send it to you, taste them. And like, we, we hurry up the whole thing uh, to do no free lunch. And then after we did no free lunch, we had a retailer in Texas that donated his portion. Uh, so a hundred percent top down of those cigars went to, we didn't make any, not even a dime. Uh, and we fed right around 30,000 people with that project. Oh, wow. And Great once God. that happened, it was, it was like, man, we couldn't really make an impact. So Robbie started calling, calling around and um, we found a program in Chicago and ironically enough, you know, when if you're at school, you can share school supplies like paintbrushes and stuff like that. But when you're at home, you have to buy your own. And a lot of people couldn't afford it. Uh, and when kids started going back to school, they needed to bring their own stuff. They could you can't you couldn't share crayons and stuff like that. So uh, that was the inner city education um, charity. We bought school supplies and art supplies for for people in Chicago that they couldn't afford them. Um, and then, and this is another coop exclusive that I'll tell you oh, wow. is uh, we're releasing a new one called El Pavo. And we built in partnership with a couple different places across the country. Uh, each pack we sell will feed one, like we're so anal about it that it has to be this way, but each pack sold will, will feed a family of five on Thanksgiving. So, I mean, it's really been like an impactful kind of uh, project for us. Um, and we continue and we're going to continue to, to do those. I mean, it's it's just it's very important to me. It's becoming more and more and more important to me as I see the impact of it. So and I think it's a good way to give back. And I think that, you know, it's a it's a it's good for everybody. And, that, and that's what's important, I think. No, it's a, I, I applaud you guys for what you did. And, you know, mm -hmm. you, you released one in September um, for Tunnels to Towers, the one. And you guys basically yes. reached out to the protocol guys, um, law enforcement guys. Uh, that was kind of a out of the box thing that you guys did with that as well um, to kind of help you help you promote that cigar. Yeah. And a hundred percent. And again, on that cigar, it was just friends with friends and we didn't we didn't make a dime off of it. Everything went to the excuse me, foundation. And uh, it was, you know, it's, it's one. I mean, how could you not love <laughs> doing a project with one, you know? No. And I think, so was, yeah, that was, yeah. that was a fun one. And I thought it was a real, and I talked, we talked to Juan about this on, on the Thursday show, you know, in a time right now where obviously the police have been under the microscope lately, you know, I thought it, it put a positive spin on the, on the work that the police and the, and the first responders have done. Um, which, and that's a great organization, Tunnels for Towers. I mean, this someone who comes from New York myself. Um, I thought that was a, the, a, a great and, – and the response that we got from that cigar, at least when we announced it, was huge. Um, it was just like – the first thing is, where can we get this cigar was the first like, – that's always the questions we get when I put a, a press st a statement or a press release or some sort of product announcement. And, and there was probably more of those I got than I saw on a lot of releases in a long time. Like, where can I get that? We want it. We want to get involved with this. Yeah. I wish, I wish we would have found more of those cigars. I mean, we'll probably, I mean, we're not, we're going to follow up with it obviously, but yeah. the cigars are phenomenal and the foundation's phenomenal and, you know, everybody involved in my opinion is phenomenal. So yeah, that was a really fun project for us. So, Tony, going into the picking these different charities, I mean, it seems very random, and that may be the the whole purpose behind it. Is is it is it is it literally like a kind of a spread the love kind of concept? Um, it's just you're you know you're kind of just look you got you and Robert are just looking for inspiration, and when it strikes, you just you just run with it. Yeah, I think you know each each cigar is kind of named after something that we thought when we smoked a cigar, and it it is very random and you guys know robert and you can imagine the kind of phone calls i get about it and he'll be like <laughs> like all my phone will ring and he'll be like yo and i'm like what's up dude and he's like he's like i just found the fucking hotness and i'm like okay and he's like this shit is amazing and he's like i'm gonna send it to you 
And then I get it like three days later and I call him back. I'm like, the cigars I'm phenomenal. He's like, we're going to, this is like the best cigar I've ever smoked. So then we'll bullshit about it while we're smoking it on the phone together and kind of decide where it's going to go. And I mean, we work, we work on the, on these like four or five brands a day. So just trying to figure out what goes where and kind of trying to fit the puzzle pieces together on like, this is going to be this and this is going to be that. And this one's we don't want. And here's a, you know, four 40 page list from this factory and a 50 page list. I mean, and, and since we, you know, we started, um, lost and found in 2013, we could barely get manufacturers to like open the doors to us. And now it's like, almost like a welcoming party when we asked to, to, to kind of start digging through stuff. So our lists have gotten bigger. Um, the cigars that we're getting are pretty, were pretty famous at one point. So it's pretty cool to, to know. It's pretty cool for me to know what the cigars were when people are smoking them uh, and not, not being allowed to tell them. It, it's kind of cool for us to try to guess it. Um, you know, I kind of like, I like, you know, as much as I'm like the rumor free cheese, free guy, there is a fun aspect to try. And, and some of them, you know, were easier to guess than houses, obviously. Um, but some of them are like, you know, I'm like, where is this coming from? I'm like, you know, and, and it, 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 it makes your mind, it, it forces you to think a lot more. And instead of like focusing on, you, you really can focus on the tobaccos and, and just try to come up with things. So it, it, I, I like that aspect of what Lost and Found. Like I said, Bear and I, we, we, we joke about gimmicky cigars. And Bear says gimmicks never work, right? But but uh, so Bear, is this a we actually named cigar? it? We named a Lost and Found gimmick. That was yeah, that I was going to say the do, the dojo yeah. project. No, and, and I, I'll uh, and, and this makes it sound like I'm an apologist here, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be because gimmicks don't work. But but it's, it's not a gimmick. They're they're transparent with it. it. it they, well, yes, they are transparent with it, but it's it's. You don't look at lost and found for like you don't look at you don't look at them individually because individually you, you, I would say that they're they're gimmicky but like you know peppered cream soda or whatever it is an example that by that is a standalone project is is a gimmick and gimmicks don't work however it's 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 not they're not standalone projects it's it's lost and found and lost and found the concept is not a gimmick um, and, and that's why it works. So I, I'll still stand by my argument because I agree. Yeah. I agree. And it's not, it's not intentionally limited. I mean, it's actually truly limited, which, you know, a lot of, a lot of things say they're limited, but they're not really limited. They're limited because someone says I'm going to limit production at this number. Right. But these are literally like the last 2,349 cigars that are in existence. Or they just throw the words limited, which I still joke around that Hoya de Monterey still has the words limited edition on Hoya Monterey, ex, uh, you know, Excaliburs. <laughs> you know, it still well, says limited edition. That cigar has been produced for like 30 years. Well, Saka will argue every cigar is <laughs> limited, right? Saka, argue, because he says, you know, there's limited tobaccos. And even if you guys told me, said, hey, I'm going to take one of these blends and release it as a core line, it's still different because of the vintages that you guys are, are getting the tobaccos from out of those factories and the aging factors that go in there. So you're probably not going to get it the same to begin with. I mean, so that's, I think, another fa factor that plays into what's really cool about these releases. Well, and they've, they've all been cigars for a very long time, which is also a rare thing. You know, you're usually like at, you know, 10 to 12 weeks as a, as a completed cigar before it gets to the marketplace. And these are completed cigars for yeah. five, six, seven to yeah. 10 years, maybe. Yeah. Um, as opposed to, you know, which I think it, all cigars on the market, which are, you know, 10 to 12 weeks old are really, really good cigars. I'm yeah. not saying that it's just that what happens if you age them without having to wait? Yeah, exactly. And and I want to give you guys and, and Robert credit. So when we got press releases for this, the, the, the first sentence in the press releases, we don't normally write press releases. We're not good at it. No, the, you guys, are, <laughs> they were good press releases. And I think it was important for, for the, the give a fuck cigars that you guys got the messaging out there very early on. Um, so people understood what you guys were doing with this offshoot of lost and found. So I think it was a good job and the information was certainly there that we needed to cover it. So, uh, if, if, if you guys are rookies at it, you're, you're a lot better than most companies is what I'll say. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, there we go. um, bear anything else on lost and found we want to hit. 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, Tony, do you, yeah, I mean, for the rest, for the remainder of 2020 or even going into 2021, I mean, uh, is there a, is there a number of uh, projects that you guys have uh, on the docket? Like, a, um, maybe you can't tell us the details of all of them, but uh, is there a number of projects that you have uh, a specific number or is that, uh, or is it kind of just, you know, as you, as you, again, kind of, as you organically find these projects, then that's when you decide to, to release them. Yeah. I mean, we always have, you know, two or three in the pipeline, whether or not they end up coming out is, you know, kind of up for debate It all. It all kind of depends on uh, a number of things. I mean, we are, we're always, we have enough, we're, we're just, we try to build enough content that we have a series of releases for everybody for the year. But if we decide, you know, something needs to take precedent and focus on that, then that's kind of like, like if, a, like if we're going to do this, the give a fuck stuff, that's kind of what takes a precedent over anything else, right, right. For us. So, like this Thanksgiving cigar right now is kind of where we're, where we're kind of putting our, our energy into. But there's some other stuff that we have um, with a various amount of, of different people. And, you know, we're doing, we did a lot of store exclusives this year for a lot of different companies where it was, uh, different retailers across the country. Um, so many I mean, we, we, we fly by the seat of our pants and that's why I think makes, makes it so great. You know, it's like, he'll like Robbie will call me and be like, Hey man, like this, you know, retailer that's really been supporting us wants to do a limited run. And I found, you know, 2000 cigars, let's do it. Um, and that could happen tomorrow or it could happen three times tomorrow. Who knows? And that's kind of like our, you know, we just did, and I, I'm about to smoke one, I think in a minute here, we just did Scooby snacks. Um, oh no a, uh, that's a <laughs> yeah. that's a great that's a great shot too since uh, you're that's the king what, of four shots yeah, yeah right <laughs> yeah i mean i'd be um, remiss you yeah go ahead, Tony. i'm sorry oh no so uh the concept behind scooby snacks is they're all different you know each pack is the same cigar but if we find you know we used to be able to smoke the rest of these things you know and if there's if we if we run across a cigar that there was a hundred cigars, you know, instead of building a brand around around that for a hundred cigars, we're releasing them as a Scooby snack because they like and the kind of the motto for it is too small to release, too good not to share. And I think we're trying to get those just even those like the 50 or 75 or 100 cigars, you know, if there's 10 bundles of it, you know, each one has sort of the like this one specifically 500 cigars found. Uh, 50 bundles, Nicaraguan, 2015, Connecticut Shade Wrapper, Nicaraguan Binder Filler, 6x50 Totoro. So we found 500 cigars. So instead of building an entire brand around it and to try to keep the cost down uh, for the consumers, we're just, it's a Scooby snack. And I feel like those are going to be, those are going to be, and the, the whole concept of the brand is fun, like you said. And I think the Scooby snack thing is going to be really fun because people are going to trade them. Oh, I like this one, or I like the Scooby snack or whatever. And that's kind of the goal with the Scooby snack thing is to kind of give um, those hundred, 200, 300 cigars um, a home. Yeah. Group, one last thing here. Yeah. I got one too. Oh, after go you ahead. go. So you, you want to go first or you me? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Just and, yeah. and I apologize for the shameless plug here. Uh, but uh, Tony, um, I Coop is a part of my show on Sunday, and I, I made a, a pretty big announcement for my show. And, and there, uh, Coop is a big part of my decision into doing this. Um, Luciano Mayrelis, Miguel Chaudel played a part of it. But uh, actually, there was another component of it. And I was remiss in not mentioning it live. Uh, but I'll mention it here. Um, the, the Give a Fuck series is actually a, a pretty was pretty big linchpin in my decision on my show and LS Fumar takes to uh, going forward. I'm going to be asking my guest to spotlight a nonprofit or charity that they want to bring attention to. Um, and so that, that was a, a, the give a fuck series was actually, a, was actually a part of, you know, the inspiration behind me wanting to do that. So uh, I wanted to thank you on this show. I, I was remiss on not mentioning it on Sunday and I, I apologize for that, but um, but I will mention it here. So apologize for the shameless plug, Coop, but nope. um, I thought it was appropriate um, because that. To, so I wanted to thank Tony and Robert for that inspiration as well. Thank you, man. I mean, that's the goal is to, you know, is to have people pay it forward. And if everybody does something, then change will start to happen. You know what I mean? It, it's not just 
one person doing it or three people doing it or a company doing it. But I think that, you know, if we can inspire other people to do it and then you inspire other people to do it, then I think that we can actually make a difference, you know, as small or large as it is, it doesn't really matter as long as it's a difference. hundred percent. Absolutely. So that, that's cool, man. Thank you for telling me about that. I appreciate that. I'm glad that makes me happy. The, the other thing I was just going to give a plug to someone, um, because he's a good friend of mine. Um, and, uh, you know, you guys also did a cigar for, uh, R and R cigar mansion, uh, Reagan, who is a, he's a very good friend of mine. Um, and he, you know, he has built, uh, he has built the Alabama Tennessee rivalry in college football into like an event down there. Um, and my goal is to go next year to his store for the weekend. I probably won't go to the game. I'd rather just hang out at his store to be honest with you, but, but uh, you guys, I heard it's insane. Yeah. And if you, have you been to the, have you been to the mansion yet? Uh, I think I have. It's an, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing, yeah. Amazing store in itself. Right. Um, but you guys released the cigar rivalry and, and Reagan was raving about the cigar. So, uh, he was very excited about it. And, uh, like I said, that is a big, even with COVID, he found a way to, uh, make, uh, lemonade out of lemons uh, this year. And I think it was, I, I can't, he probably benefited to the game. Yeah, was def- what, I've, I've a hundred percent been there before. Yeah. 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 It's a great store. Um, so yeah. And like I said, I think he lucked out this year that the game wasn't in Alabama. So next year, the game's in Alabama. Um, which if you ever have a chance to go to that stadium, whether you're a college football fan or not, you're just going to feel the history is going to, it just kind of oozes into you. So, um, but his store is the most unique store I've been to probably in the country. Uh, it truly is a cigar mansion. Um, and, uh, I was down at first wedding and we spent a lot of the pre-wedding festivities at, at the store. So it was, it was, it was great. So it's good to see that cigar as well. It's a great, that's a great retail exclusive, um, line that he's done. So uh, good job by there as well. Thank you. All right. Um, so let's turn a little attention over to you. I mean, we kind of mentioned this early in the show, but Tony, you guys, uh, now you and Jeremy um, have built your own podcast, right? So you joined this. And, you know, we, we were talking a little about this on Sunday on Bear's show. And I think um, we did mention this one because we've seen a lot of people get into the podcast game in the cigar business. And some have had varied success but i think you guys clearly have uh done some success here um with the four shots and um talk a little about what went into that um and then i'll tell my story about my appearance so it it started (laughs) with like uh jeremy was doing he does every what he used to do it every day at the beginning of covid was cigars and coffee in the morning and then i at night i was just doing like a zoom hangout and, it, and people started calling it uh, Tito's with Tony because I drink Tito's vodka. And by the end of the Zoom, like four hours later, I'd be really drunk. And then uh, we started talking, Jeremy and I, about combining the things. And I was like, well, what if we like kind of did sort of like a relief kind of show where it's like not really about cigars. It's more about like life and cigars are kind of because we always talked about when Jeremy and I travel and when we travel with the team, we will always get an Airbnb if we can. And essentially it always ends up with us on the patio by a fire drinking and smoking cigars. And like a lot of great ideas come from that, you know, and a lot of great things come from that. And I think that that's a very important thing. And I think that's a very important thing that people have been missing through COVID. And that was kind of roundabout how we ended up with this thing. And it's like literally a show about nothing. And that's kind of the fun part. It's like, okay, okay, on Tuesdays at eight o'clock, like we're going to smoke cigars. And if you want to talk about cigars, we'll talk about cigars. But if you want to talk about, we just did a small one just for our podcast people yesterday. And we talked about scary movies. And I think that it's just a round table of people that are friends that have become friends through the cigar industry and another reason why the cigar industry is so great is like you guys want to be my friends if it wasn't for cigars. And I think that that's we can have a conversation outside of that. But ultimately, like the cigars tie us all together. And I think that's the kind of the, the purpose of that show and where we kind of got started. And but I this so everybody that's listening knows this is the first time I'm hearing of the story because Coop was on and we did more than four. <laughs> we did. I think we did six. 
yeah. it's six. <laughs> yeah. So so let's kind of preface the story for folks who are tuned in and obviously Tony's benefit. So before I went on the show, Bear, you made a comment to Tony about this, right? About what was yes. going to happen. So, so I'll let you tell that part and then I'll tell what happened after the show. So, 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 to, so Tony and I have, have we, we've 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 talked a few times uh, during during COVID and everything. As I mentioned, I've I've, I've been successful in procuring some cigars, uh, specifically the Crew Mexi Soul from uh, from Tony's store. And so we've but we've been cu- cutting up on catching up on life on uh, other aspects. And you asked me to be a guest on the show. I haven't uh, been I haven't uh, haven't had made my appearance yet, but I, I'm looking forward to the opportunity. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to have coupon. And I said, okay, um, just take take it easy on my guy because he's 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 not he's not a drinker um and um and as like he started and you, you're like really and i said well he's act. it's actually funny covid he, he started to build up this nice collection of of really really fine spirits so uh so he's gonna have plenty to drink or plenty of options to drink uh but i was like take it easy on my guy because he's just not a, he's just not a big drinker uh i think i've um we uh we shared a uh a time with a pina colada down in the dr at one point that's the only time i've ever actually had an alcoholic beverage with the guy he's usually got his diet coke and um and i mean i've got my water so it's not like i'm uh, you know boozing it up while he's he's you know clean uh you know uh, clean and simple over there but I, that was my that was my my precursor conversation to coop's appearance on four shots with tony and jeremy right so <laughs> So I went on the show and I had um, uh, uh, some of those out, some of those spirits I brought out. There was some whiskeys. Um, there was a Woodford Reserve. I know that. Um, I want to say there was a Grand Marnier in there. I, f- I forget what it was, right? And I did. I went through the six shots and I was relatively fine, right? Um, I didn't say anything stupid <laughs> from what I remember, right? And I was great. Well, and then, and then no, I remember. I remember nothing I, stupid, right? No. no. So I remember I was like. Coop. I think we talked afterwards and I was fine talking afterwards to Tony and the group. And I said, well, I got to go. I got to go grab some dinner. Right. Cause I hadn't eaten. So I went in and, and uh, before I never ended up eating dinner that night, which is the other thing. Um, so the next thing um, we have kind of a, uh, there's a bunch of us who sometimes do zooms. And I think it was John McTavish from uh, developing palettes sets up a zoom and I get the link and I click into it and I'm talking to these guys. And it was um, eventually it was just me and John. Right. The next thing I know, I don't remember if I mumbled something about the Pope, right? I mumbled something <laughs> about the Pope, right? I remember that. And then the next thing I know, I I was out cold and I wake up. <laughs> I wake up and no one's on the Zoom chat anymore. I, I That's went amazing. And I must have been out for about 15, 20 minutes. And I don't have and they're gone. And I'm, I feel horrible. Like I'm falling like passed out in the middle of talking to John, right? And it, John will, John will attest this. And, and it, I was like, oh, man, I'm really sorry. This thing, I didn't think this thing, it hit me like a ton of bricks, right? Um, so the next thing I got to do is I'm like, shit, I got to just drink a lot of water. I don't want to wake up with a hangover. And, and that's what I, and I didn't wake up with a hangover, which was good. But yeah, that was very, six shots for me, Tony, was, um, I, yeah, you guys went to, it's not one. I'm not one can sell is what I'm going to tell you, but I did pass out on that Zoom chat. You're, you're I training though. You're I, training. I would love this to is, have seen John, John could have been evil to me and took pictures. Right. And he did. Right. They're, 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 <laughs> thank God. Right. Cause I, if he, and maybe he has those pictures and I don't know, but I passed that. Like I said, I woke up and it's the next thing. It's like 1145 and the Zoom chat's empty. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? Yeah. But, we wanna, I want to do like a, because we did to end our season we did a like kind of a round table where everybody that watches the show came on for like five minutes to like bust our balls or ask us questions but i want to do that with guests but have everybody in the same room at one time like like us juan like all the all these people and just get everybody really drunk and see what happens because i think that'd be hilarious oh man because we did what fit what did you say we did Coop 15 on with Juan. You had to do a 15 or 16 with Juan. I drank an entire liter of Tito's vodka. That's all I know. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, the, the best part of this, the, 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 was the, the, the post game of this. So, so he tells, he passed out, he drinks a bunch of water. He doesn't have a hangover, but um, I, 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 I listened to the replay the next morning. Uh, 
and uh and then that, that night i i give coop a call and he's like uh he doesn't answer the phone and and then i i shoot him a text he doesn't answer the text oh because the sleep was all off and, and staying up and late the, yeah. yeah and then so we finally catch up on thursday uh before his show and i'm like hey he's like yeah man i'm sorry i was sleeping i was like i was like I was like, those six shots did you in, right, man? You were still, I was like, you were still sleeping it off an entire day later. And he's like, yeah, I think it had something to do with that. So I was like. <laughs> Thank goodness I didn't do it live on the air. I mean, I'm sure Tony and the guys would have wanted to see that, right? But yeah, because I stayed up because I was worried about going to sleep and get a hangover. So I'm drinking water, right? And I'm just making sure I hydrate myself the whole, and I didn't want to go to sleep and wake up with a hangover. I finally, but I got no sleep that night on top of it. So it threw my whole sleep schedule off, which was, which was, so I think Wednesday I was, I went to sleep like 6 PM. Like <laughs> the next day <laughs> that real, like, yeah, that, that was, uh, I don't remember the last time I've done six shots. So that was history in the making on, on the four shot show. I can assure you. We, we have a lot of, we have a lot of those on the show. You were, <laughs> we, you were history. The one episode was history. <laughs> I mean, it, it's that's that's the goal. It's supposed to be fun, right? Yeah. We and, need and, stories. And look, you guys really put a lot into the production on this show, too. So I want to give you and, and mm -hmm. you guys have really taken a lot of uh, attention to detail with the production. Um, and I got to give you guys a lot of credit on that as well, because it's a well-produced show. It's not easy to produce a show, as, as you guys know, um, especially when you have to produce it. You're, you, you, I know you guys have a producer, right? Yeah. Um, so one of my one of my best friends. Uh, his name's Brandon Noel. He produces the show yeah, every week. He did us. a great job with it. Yeah. So he kept every. He, he kind of. But it's like we produce our own show here, and it's tough. I don't know how Bear does it by himself on Sunday. I mean, that's just what he does is is Herculean in my book. It has its challenges from yep. moment to moment. But Tony, I'll, I I I do want to respectfully disagree with you on one point about the show. Um, it, it's it's easily become one of the the shows that I've I've really come to enjoy in its yeah. in its short history thus far. Um, and I enjoy it for this reason. You, you, you said that it's a show about nothing, and this is where I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. Um, what I think what you've been able to accomplish um, is something that is incredibly difficult. You know, Coop and I, you know, we, we kick off the show each day, you know, each, each episode, and he does it with Aaron each week with what we call organic conversation. And it can be a, literally a about nothing right it's about anything that you know it could be something during the day something that strikes us in the moment but it's organic conversation but you've been able to take that organic conversation and and string it for an entire line of consciousness um over the span of an entire show it's it's an incredibly organic conversation but it, it's it, it's not all over the place and that's the thing that I really enjoy about it. Like you said, it's about bringing people together and, and having that, 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 that lucid conversation piece. And, and um, yeah, there's, I mean, you talk, uh, one of the best ones that I've really enjoyed was your show with Antoine. Um, and you guys, you, you guys hit the gamut uh, in the spectrum of subjects and, and, and everything. And it was really, and I think it's, I think it's because Antoine and himself is a very unique individual. He's not, a, he doesn't have a long history in this industry, but he certainly made an impact in his short time with it. Um, so you guys had a lot, you guys had a lot of, a lot of material there kind of just waiting in the wings just because of the nature of the uh, unique person that he is. But I, 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 I'll disagree with you. I think, I, I think it's a show about something, but it's, it's just incredibly organic. And I, I, what you've been able to do with that each and every week um, is in, from where I sit is incredibly impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, you, that it's, we didn't think again, it was like lost and found. Like we didn't think it was going to be anything and it's still, we just want, we just want it to be a fun place to hang out. And I think that that, I don't know. I, I hope that it grows and I, and I, and I hope that we're doing it right. So, you know, it's not like we we're doing it for any other reason other than that. Very, very good. Um, just a quick update. I think the Dodgers are about to win this thing, so stay tuned. Yep. It's uh, it's not over yet as far as what I'm seeing. Yeah, my boy Mookie Betts with the go-ahead, man. Yep, so we'll, we'll keep folks up to date on that as well. All right, so I um, want to turn our attention to – and then we have – Tony, how are you doing on time? Do you have some time? Because we have some fun topics ahead too. 
If you I want do. To say. I have plenty of time. Okay, you just let awesome. us know. So one more, yeah. just kind of on 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 you and, and what you're doing. Um, any updates on the wine end? What you're doing with wines right now? Uh, no. I mean, we've I've just been focused on Viva La Vida. I mean, we started um, Youngstown Coffee Company. We've we've been in the coffee business forever. Um, I've been we have a big touch of modern sale coming up on Thursday. Um, so I've been a lot of my energy in, in cigars and coffee. Um, I haven't been focused on, on wine. I think I'd be stretching myself too thin, um, with that, um, other than Viva La Vida, but, uh, we'll get, I'll get there eventually. Um, but for the time being coffee, cigars, and four shots, four to 15 shots every Tuesday, <laughs> depending. Four to 15. <laughs> um, great, great. Great plug to plug Youngstown Coffee Company. Uh, Tony sent me some of his coffee. Uh, it, it's 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 incredible. Uh, I and, and you guys ro- you guys roast you guys found a local roaster, uh, right, Tony? Yeah. And yep. Really, really well done. Those. Well, we uh, we now roast it ourselves. That's so we have the roaster, and I have two guys that have have come up in the in our companies with me that that roast every Tuesday. Um, but yeah, we're, we're manufacturing it ourselves and it's, uh, it's fun, man. Coffee's fun. Cigars, a lot of different flavors, a lot of different stuff going on in your palate. No, the coffee, there is a La Barber coffee, right? But that's not you guys, right? That's something completely different. Yeah, it's a, yeah, something completely different. Yeah. Cause I saw it when I, when I was looking before the show, um, it said 2012, but I didn't think it was you guys. I thought you guys were doing mm-hmm. Youngstown. That's why I was wondering. So. Excellent. All right. Um, why don't we turn our attention to a couple of our fun segments? But before I do that, I want to just mention again the the prize giveaway, uh, the 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 uh, Vega Fina prize giveaway. Um, you will get a set of Bluetooth ear earbuds, ear pods, whatever you want to call them, uh, branded with with Vega Fina on it. Um, you will get the torch lighter, a really nice torch lighter. And you get a bottle of the uh, the uh, Vega Fina Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and all you have to do is um, you have to tell me where what country was the Vega Fina 1998, which is a new release in the U.S. now for Vega Fina. What country was the Vega Fina 1998 first released in? You have to go into the Cigar Coop chat on the Cigar Coop page where this is being streamed not in a watch party or anything. Tell me that country and, and hashtag it with Vega Fina 1998. And I will pick one winner at random. So um, we'll, we'll kind of do that. And it comes in a very nice gift box as well. So we gave, uh, the, we gave the answer away earlier in the show. So hit we gave the, the rewind, answer, watch yeah. it. And guess what? Google works really well too. I mean, these are, this is open book here. So we're, we're uh, you know, use Google and you can win. Um, but you have to get the right answer to win and it has to be tagged right to win. Um, and please, if you win, if you're going to enter, please be contactable. So we can, we want to give you your prize. So uh, that's the goal here. All right. So, um, this, um, actually we're going to get into another fun segment right now that we do on the show. And this is called, uh, one must go and one must go. It comes to you from United cigars, United. We smoke, but one must go brought to you by United cigars featuring La Giana Havana distributors of Jose Dominguez, Bandolero, Garofalo, and the highly acclaimed Atabay and Byron by United smoke United live United. So in this segment, we're going to present three options. And, um, basically you have to basically one of these options, you have to kind of eliminate from your repertoire, namely one must go, um, and you take it off the table, like, and, and the other two stay. Um, and Bear, you came up with this, and I thought it was appropriate having kind of Tony on tonight with this, so we get yeah. him to participate. So you, Bear came up with this one. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bear here, um, and this is gonna be—I think this is gonna be a really fun one tonight. Yeah. So I, I what I usually do. Uh, Coop and I, we've had some fun with this segment on this particular show, and we usually pick just random things. And it, it really, you know, to to our point earlier about about four shots, Tony, as uh, you you have that great organic conversation, it really is developed in some nice organic conversation. But today, I kind of wanted to take a uh, a cue from the way I do it on El Oso Fumar takes, and 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 kind of mold it sort of on our guest tonight. And uh, you know, as you 
you kind of alluded to earlier and joked around about in college and you know, everyone thought you were a part of the alleged mafia because of, you know, your last name and everything as well and your Italian ancestry. But um, I saw, so I thought it'd be really interesting to, to piece together this thing. So I'm a big fan of film and one of my absolutely favorite films um, and film series, I guess you could say in history is, is, is the Godfather series. And the Godfather series uh, featured some incredible, incredible actors and actresses over the course of those three films and um and really iconic actors who you know you know are, are the you know they're in their they're actually in their pinnacle their apex and 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 really have uh, spawned a, a generation of, of fantastic actors and stuff and so i i decided to pick three actors um that uh, were inspired by that Italian uh, film. And it looks like the Dodgers won, Coop. So at the Dodgers are world champions. Thanks to Mark, by the way, who gave us that update. Yes, the Dodgers are world champions. Uh, and we'll, we'll do, I'll do my thank you to the Tampa Bay Rays later. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, back to one must go. So uh, I wanted to, because this is a, this is a, this is a really difficult, I think this is going to be a really difficult decision for us, gentlemen. So the one must go tonight, you have to kick one of these actors to the curb and tell us the reason why so here here are your choices uh marlon brando the godfather himself al pacino and robert de niro who pay, plays a younger vito corleone in godfather 2 um so those are your choices gentlemen marlon brando al pacino robert de niro who gets who's got to go and why well, Al Pacino is my favorite actor. I own every single Al Pacino movie. So, for me, like he's got to stay. Who's your what's your favorite film? Al Pacino film. My favorite Al Pacino film besides is it Godfather? besides is it I say besides Godfather. Um, I really like Serpico. I really like Dog Day Afternoon. Mm -hmm. Um, to to pick a favorite, I don't think I could do it. I think they're all my favorites in different different ways. I like one of my favorite movies of all time is Heat. I think that yeah. movie is incredible. Um, so I can't really pick a favorite Al Pacino movie. A Scent of a Woman. I mean, you can't. Oh yes. Yeah. Any given Sunday, I love him in Any Given Sunday as well. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Like you can't really kind of put your finger on. I think Al Pacino is going to go down as being one of the greatest actors of all time. If oh, not, he is. If yeah. if he hasn't already been noted, noted. As and that's that. what's hard about this list. They're all three of them. You yeah. can you can pick that argument, right? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I would say Brando's got to go, just because he's already gone. But I mean, it, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I would also say it because, like his movie, for me, his movies weren't as impactful as Robert De Niro's and Al Pacino's, so. If we had to get so if it was like a like a uh, men in black brain thing that was like, you'll never know about Marlon Brando ever or the other two, I would give up Brando for sure. But I was never a big fan of Brando, Marlon Brando's movies or and he's kind of like weird. So yeah, I was never really a fan of him. Like the Island of Dr. Moreau is a very, very weird movie. Well, and his role in Apocalypse Now is was yes. very was it was very bizarre. Um, and, and you know that that method acting, the school of acting that he came from, he he he, he the art form of acting to Marlon Brando, at least comparatively speaking to the other two gentlemen on this list, or is just you know uh, just uh, just an entire different methodology and everything. You know, he's not Italian, you know, he, which is which is even more interesting because like you know um, you know he's he's actually more of English descent. Uh, British Isles and everything, but uh, he has that name Brando, so people assumed right. uh, that he was. But it's actually it, that's actually part of his German ancestry. It was Brandau, B R A N D A U, I believe. And so, it just he, when he became an actor, it became Brando, and he changed it and uh, and everything. So, um, so Brando's got to go for you. Okay, interesting, interesting, because he's he's arguably and well considered by a lot of critics to be greatest actor of all time. Um, which is uh, which is interesting. And I'm being I'm playing I, in in my thing here. I'm being completely selfish. You know what I mean? Like I'm not I'm not making. Yeah, this is personal. This is personal taste. Yeah, this is this is what this you is want is. to go. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Okay. Coop, what about you? So let me kind of, let me kind of, I'll just go through the three and then I'll tell you uh, mine. So if you look at Marlon Brando's career, um, he, a lot of people had him, I think a couple of publications said he was the actor of the century. Um, but if you mm-hmm. really look at Marlon Brando's career, it was really, there was a point from like um, the early fifties to like mid sixties where Marlon Brando was, um, you know, he, how, how can we, there, he was, he was it. I mean, he was without a doubt. Um, he was in a lot of, a lot of hits in there. He, um, he won the Academy Award for On the Waterfront. This is going back to 1954. Mm-hmm. Uh, One of my favorite films. Great movies. Great movies, right? But Marlon Brando went, had, a, had a period in the 60s where, um, you know, he, uh, he, 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 he had a lot of misses, right? His career, his, the films just didn't do it. Godfather was like a kind of a renaissance he had in the 70s. Um, but his roles kind of changed um, in the 70s. He became more of a supporting actor. Um, and I think that's I think that was by choice. You know, so you look at him in like Godfather, you look at him in Apocalypse Now, Superman. Um, he, it changed a bit with him. Right. Let me go over to Al Pacino. Uh, Al Pacino. Um, you look at him and what people don't realize about Al Pacino. Yeah, he he's won awards. He's won not only an Academy Award for Sense of a Woman and multiple nominations, he's won Emmys. And he's won mm-hmm. two Tony Awards, which people don't realize, yeah. right? So he's won three of the four and was nominated for a Grammy, right? So he's almost had the Grand Slam like Rita Moreno has. Rita Moreno is the only, I think, actor, actress who's won all four. He came pretty close with that, right? So, and you look at, I think when you look at those Al Pacino movies, it's those starring roles he had. Um, you mentioned Dog Day Afternoon. You mentioned Scent of a Woman, uh, Serpico, uh, me, sorry, sorry, Serpico, Carlito's Way, right? Then oh, Carlito's you know, Way, Jesus. Carlito's I, Way, yeah. How did I not mention that. Oh my goodness! And, and so you kind of look at that, and then Starface. You, yeah. The Merchant of Venice, man. If you want to go, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, right. like a Merchant of Venice, you know. But let's not forget some of the TV roles he's had, right? Um, he played Phil Spector. He played Joe Paterno, right? Um, so he's he. People forget the television work. He's the Joe Paterno movie. Him as Joe Paterno, and that didn't get an award nomination. I don't know how he did. He was he was so believable as Joe Paterno. So I think Al Pacino's resume is there. De Niro. Let's take the politics away from De Niro. Um, you could argue. You know, you I argue Rocky's my all time greatest movie. Uh, of all time, my, and I love Stallone in that. But the, uh, there's a couple of boxing movies that I think are right up there. His performance in Raging Bull, Raging one Bull. of the yep. one of the great performances, single performances ever, ever. I mean, his role in Raging Bull, um, his role in Godfather as the young Vito Corleone, which there's no English being spoken like, in that, right? Which is amazing. And then he kind of makes himself into this comedy actor. All right. So yeah. Midnight Run, his performance, he was he was great in Midnight Run. Right. That was an incredible movie. Then he does the uh, Meet the Fockers right later on. So he's very versatile. So based on those three, I, it's hard for me to put Marlon Brando up against the, the, what those two guys have done. Um, and and again, if I go back to Godfather, I, yeah, this is going to sound bad. I think there could have been other actors to play Vito Corleone. I really do. Um, not that he did, not that Marlon Brando didn't do a great job, but some of the other performances in Godfather, I think, overshadowed, overshadowed those. You know, you, you look at the uh, performances of, of uh, you know, Sonny Corleone, you know, Michael Corleone, those, those other characters, I think, overshadowed the Vito Corleone character, Tom, Tom Kagan, you know, things like that. So Marlon Brando is going on my book as well. Yeah, I mean, wow. in, the, in the Godfather, you, you have Robert Duvall that plays Tom Hagen. You got uh, James Caan that plays Sonny. Sonny. And then I can't remember the actor's name. It was the same guy that was in Dog Day Afternoon that plays uh, the little brother. Oh, Fredo. I mean, Fredo. Yeah. Fredo. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, those guys were just incredible. Oh incredible my goodness! Actors you you talk about that as well, and um, you know you have um, Alex Rocco in there as well. Um, you know, so Alex Rocco. Um, wait, why am I? The name is escaping me. Uh, the name who he played in that movie. Are you talking uh, about Mo Green? Uh, Mo Green. Mo Green. Mo Green. Mo Green. Mo Green. Yeah. Mo Green. Um, you have um, Abe Vigoda. You know, is in the Talia Shire. So th- there was a lot of competition. Diane Keaton. I mean, so that was yeah, a Diane Keaton. Yeah. So 
So, yeah, he's going. Uh, Marlon Brando goes also with me. And John, John Cazale, by the way, is uh, the, the gentleman who played uh, Fredo. Yes. yes. Yeah. On the afternoon, right? Am I wrong? Yeah. Yes. Yes, you're right. No, 100%. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Sonny Corleone is my favorite, one of my favorite characters of all time. And and, and, and to James Conn's perform the bad James thing is they, they the bad thing is they killed him off uh, at the toll booth. So uh, yeah, yeah, uh, but uh, spoilers, Coop. <laughs> okay, if you haven't seen The Godfather, shame on you. So. Yeah, I know. If no, yeah, The Godfather, you know, uh, the the Tom Hanks movie, Tom Hanks Meg Ryan movie. They they talk about about how Tom Hanks talks about how The Godfather is the is the sum of all wisdom for all men. Um, and that's a hundred percent spot on, like, you know, like, you know, Hey, if you're leaving, you know, if you're packing for a trip, you know, what do you, what should I pack for my trip? I'll leave the gun, take the cannoli, you know, um, you know, what, what day of the week is it? Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday. <laughs> um, it's the sum of all wisdom, man. The Godfather is incredible. And the fact that all three of these actors start in the film, um, I'm, I'm really kind of shocked Coop, that you, uh, that you me, you the old time guy, me, the old time guy. Yeah. But it's hard. I mean, you look at the resume of Pacino and, and De Niro, sure. it's and, and now these guys are elder statesmen in the acting world today. So these guys are in their 70s. Yeah. And I think they've accomplished more than Marlon Brando did. I really do. I mean, Marlon Brando had that run from like the mid 50s to the mid 60s. But and then had that renaissance. But again, Pacino and, and De Niro have been doing this for over 40, 40, almost 50 years. So that, that's where yeah. this really comes to. What did you uh, think about the Irishman? I liked it. Oh, Irishman was good. I liked really it a good. lot. Yeah, I liked it. The, I the, te the technology kind of was a little weird. Um, yeah, it was kind of weird for me too. The uh, I, I loved uh, I loved watching the 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 documentary afterward because they were talking about they did a roundtable with uh, um, with Scorsese and they were talking about how because uh, you know Al Pacino plays uh, Hoffa and uh, you know there's a scene where Hoffa's yelling at the TV in his basement and. Uh, you know, he gets up off this chair and they had to do this take several times because at the time, you know, it, during the, the, the sequence of the film, you know, Hoffa is supposed to be like a, you know, a 40 year old man. And, you know, Al Pacino in reality is, you know, fucking 75. And so you know, getting out of the chair, he's getting out of the chair like an old man. And like he, they had to do this take so many times so that they didn't show him grunting uh, because he was trying to get out of this chair and. And, uh, you know, his, you know, his, his natural age, you know, technology can't hide, you know, the fact that you're straining to get out of a chair as a 70 year old man. So well, it's, as it's, a 36 year old man, I can't get out of a chair. So, <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. That, so. Yeah. <laughs> Especially I can't get out of one after uh, doing four shots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, um, Bear, who do you got? Really, really interesting. I'm, 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 I'm really kind of well. I'm also shocked about your observation about the Godfather because I think, I think Vito Corleone's character, uh, played by Marlon Brando in the, in the, in the, in the first, the first film, uh, is one of my favorite acting performances of all time. I, I, I don't get me wrong. I think, I think Al Pacino wins the when if we're talking about wins the film. I think Al Pacino wins that movie. Uh, you know, as Michael Corleone, but I think uh, the. The the found the way that Marlon Brando's character sets the tone of the film, the opening scene, and he, how Coppola really strategically places uh, Marlon Brando throughout that film, he really steers that direction of that film, and 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 his his performance in that film is just just absolutely incredible. Um, and so it, it was. It, it was one of my favorite performances and I, I just kind of want to go over there, there, this, this run that, and I'm a big, uh, you know, for people who don't know, I'm actually a huge Shakespeare fan. I read, I read a lot of, I still read a lot of classic Shakespeare. Um, I, um, sh he's one of my favorite authors, uh, play slash playwrights. I really enjoy Shakespeare. And, uh, speaking of Al Pacino, uh, I'm really excited about a future project, Tony. I don't, I don't know if you have any desire to, uh, if you have any Shakespearean, love um but he's playing king lear he played he was in the merchant of venice we talked about him playing shylock but he's actually in the he's going to be playing king lear and that's that's actually my all-time favorite play by shakespeare and so i'm i'm ecstatic i'm so so excited um to see uh to see pacino play king lear i think that'll be phenomenal um um this was a like i said this was a really really difficult decision for me um, you know, when you look at like Marlon Brando's run, like you said, from the 50s coup, like, you know, Miss Streetcar Named Desire, he played Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. There's the the Shakespeare uh, thing, the wild one, you know, 
He played uh, Stra- Johnny Strabler. He, he was in Guys and Dolls, um, you know, The Fugitive Kind, um, Mutiny on the Bounty. You know, he was, uh, you know, L- Lieutenant Christian in that, you know, in the in the early 60s. Uh, the Chase, The Appaloosa, The Night of the Following Day. I mean, these are some really iconic 50s and 60s films. And, and then it kind of all went downhill um and i think it's because the weirdness just caught up with him and apocalypse now when he played kurtz just like that was the end for for me like some of his films after that like even later on in you know as an older man uh in 2001 he was in the score with norton i was gonna bring that up and de niro and de niro and that's right he he was it was just so painful it was painful yeah i the, the, took the words right out of my mouth tony it was painful to watch that but kind of unilaterally I'll, you know and coop actually gave him kudos for this that's what i've kind of seen de niro's critique the, 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 the this this departure and 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 it certainly shows his versatility not taken away from him, but this departure and going in these comedic roles, like, you know, meet the parents, meet the Fockers, um, you know, direction that his, that Robert De Niro's, De Niro's career trajectory has gone through. I'm, I'm not that, I mean, I like those movies, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of his, his earlier stuff. Like, you know, the, you know, Mean Streets, you know, obviously The Godfather 2, you know, the mid nineties film. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. Uh, one of my favorite films of all time uh, is Ronin. Oh yeah. That's amazing. That movie's amazing. The movie's incredible. And if you like, that's an action film. And if you kind of look back, I, I actually enjoy the dialogue a lot more. He's in, we talk about comedic, right? We talk about that departure. Um, Robert De Niro's comedic timing in that film in a very serious film in a very serious role in an action film it's hilarious because there's very little dialogue, but it's, he's so well-timed in it. And it, it's, it, it's an incredible film. If you guys haven't seen Ronan, if anyone watching hasn't seen Ronan, they need to, they need to see it. Um, and De Niro's incredible in it. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, Tony already kind of reminisced about Al Pacino and I, there, there, there are certain like iconic Al Pacino f- roles that, again, that I just, I would, I, I thought Serpico was great. I would, I'm not a Scarface guy. I've just never truly appreciated that film. I just don't think, I don't, for whatever reason, there's some great acting in it, uh, some great actors and actresses in it, but I, I'm just, how do you feel about Scarface, Tony? Like, are you a Scarface? I know you said you, you, you own every single one of his films, but it's, it, was- I think it, I think it is what it goes on the shelf for like great things that he's done. But as a movie, I'm not a huge fan. Like in the collection of all Al Pacino's movies, I would put it like near the bottom, actually. Because mm-hmm. if you, you take like Carlito's Way, you take Donnie Brasco. Donnie, that's the film I was going to mention. It's Donnie Brasco. Panic in Needle Park, Serpico, Devil's Advocate. Uh, I just watched 88 Minutes again the other day, and that movie's incredible. Great role. Yeah. Really I underrated. Mean, yeah. Really underrated. Uh, Insomnia, Christopher Nolan's first film. The Walter Burke character in The Recruit with Colin Farrell. The Recruit's an amazing movie. And I think that, you know, in that list of, like, amazing roles that Pacino has had, that Scarface is, like, close to the bottom for me. Um, and, like like I said, I don't think anything really compares to Heat. I mean, I think that movie is, like, one of the greatest action movies ever made. Uh, Because that bank, the bank robbery scene is like one of the the greatest scenes in like action movie history, in my opinion. Yeah. Vincent Hanna is one of those characters like that made Al Pacino made overacting because that role is really overacted. Oh, yeah. But it's she's got a great ass. She's got a great ass. It's such a head all the way up. It is. and, and, And that 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 over the top kind of makes is it actually kind of makes its way into other films like he did it earlier on he had some great overacting moments in ascent of a woman which led to that academy award and he kind of took it with him into heat 
And then in devil's advocate, I mean, how over the top can you be other than right. Satan? Right. I mean, Jesus, um, you know, that the, even um, I loved him in, I mean, he was the perfect villain in oceans 13. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, and that was like, and it's funny cause you watch these movies and you kind of, like follow Al Pacino's real life. I feel like, like in these movies, like at, of course, like Ocean's Thirteen, he's like this, like super eccentric, dick of a millionaire, right? So, but you could perfectly, you could absolutely see him being in Vegas and being that guy. Yeah, hundred percent. Right? And uh, uh, um, another another De Niro Pacino pairing was the Righteous Kill, where he plays yeah. Rooster. Yep. And Ian, uh, that's a that's another interesting twist of a character. I have to revisit um, that movie. I've only seen it like once or twice. Yeah, the real it's a really it's a it's a it's an underrated film. I think 88 minutes is a better film. But I, I, this is ironic though because I when I when I first started looking at this like Marlon Brando uh, is is uh, he, he is some in, in some of my classic favorite films. Streetcar Named Desire, one of my all-time favorites. On the Waterfront, easily one of my my favorite classical films. Um favorite classical films and you know uh, you know mutiny on the bounty his his role in that was you know standing up for what was what was just and but having it just go completely wrong um you know really you know it's the it's the the mutiny on the bounty is the classic example of um, you know, no good deed goes unpunished or, you know, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I mean, you can throw a couple metaphors at that film and it sticks and his role is incredible with it. Um, but as I kind of dissected, I think like, as I looked over time, I thought, you know, I, I kind of took the same approach that you guys did and looked at their career spans in general. And I'm not a fan, as, even though I'm not a fan of what De Niro has done lately. Um, to me, the, the, last, the last truly great film that De Niro did was Ronin. Um, but I love Ronan so much and what he did before that um, is just really showcase that he's, he's just one of the finest actors of all time and everything. So I, 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 I it's, it's shocking to me as I'm even saying this, but I, I have to agree with both of you. I think that Marlon Brando has to go. Um, and I'm, and when I first looked at this trio, it's interesting because I, I, I initially had kind of tagged at Al Pacino as the, as the guy looking in. And then I just looked back kind of like you did, Tony. I looked back over time and looked at all these films that he's done. Like, no, there's this one. Oh, and this, oh, and this one. And I just kept going and I kept going. And it was um, just an incredible, incredible list. And and uh, even though I'm just I, I said I'm not a fan of it. I actually hate the movie Scarface. I just I mean, like I loathe oh, it. I oh, really you, don't like it at all. Well, you and Helen Rubin are going to be removed from the room. <laughs> so, um, but. I mean, overall, yeah, I had, I, I had to, even though he's just his, just incredible run in that early fifties and sixties in classical film, it's just awesome. It just, I, I have to, I have to kick Marlon Brando the curb. So I'm, I'm shocked that I'm even saying that. But I mean, they're, they're, they're three of the finest actors in history. They, they are. I mean, that's just like when you came up with that question, I'm like, wow, that's it, man. That's the question we're running with. That was, that was great. That was a really good one. So that was our one must go segment sponsored by United Cigars. Um, our next segment we're going to get into um, is um, this is um, our uh, great things are happening here. We look at um, some positive stories that have happened in the world and not, not necessarily cigars, right? These are other things here. Um, and we each, Bear and I each pick a story that's kind of positive. Um, I picked, and this one I think everyone knew I was, maybe I would pick this one, was uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Alex Smith of the uh, Washington football team um, took the field um, in an in a, in a NFL football game. And Alex Smith is a former number one pick in the NFL draft. He, he had his struggles. He, he went to the 49ers, um, and he had, he had his struggles there. Uh, a lot of people thought he'd be a bust. He went over to Kansas City and became uh, – he really became, I think, an elite quarterback at that point. You know, one of the better quarterbacks. Um, he didn't sign a big contract with Washington. And in an NFL game, he suffers a, a major leg injury. Um, 
the leg injury was really bad, uh, required a lot of reconstruction on the leg. It required hospitalization. Um, in the hospital, he developed a condition called septus, which is a, a blood infection that starts to shut down the organs of your body. And it's very similar to what I had um, a couple of years ago. So I, I know full well what you do to, and he had it a lot worse than I did, um, is what I'll say. Um, he also had to have 17 surgeries on that leg, right? Plus come back from a, a, a septus, which is a, which is a major killer in this country, it's particularly with hospitalizations. It's when infections kind of spreads into the bloodstream and it's when, when an infection hits the bloodstream, it's bad. It's life-threatening is what I'll just tell you. Um, the fact that he came back, a lot of people thought he'd never, a lot of people didn't, they didn't know if he was going to live. Like those points, and if you, there was a document, they didn't know he was going to live. Um, he came back and he didn't have a great game by any means. Um, he didn't win a starting job on that, but it is one of the greatest comebacks an athlete has ever overcome. Um, and it's a positive story when, when we always, in, in the world of sports, there's all the negativity. This is an absolute positive story. And he may, he doesn't have to take the football field ever again in my life. The fact he got back into NFL conditioning and took a football field, took the football field. He is my great things are happening here choice for this episode. No, it's a, it's a great story. Um, yeah. Alex Smith is one of those, those feel good stories in general, even before yeah. this, uh, yeah. you know, he was a number one pick and you, you, you think, how could you have empathy for a guy who goes number one in the NFL draft? But, you know, he, he was, you know, uh, you know, the 49ers for a long stretch there were, you know, just as bad as, you know, uh, all respect, Tony, from the state that you hail from, but um, it, they're just as bad. They were just. Well, wait a minute. As so the, the owner, rounds. the owner of the 49ers is from Youngstown. So we have yep. bad football yeah. in our blood. Yeah, the, the Bartle <laughs> family. Don't forget. But I grew up and I met Joe Montana, Steve Young, Jerry Rice. They always were at, at functions in Youngstown. So I was a 49ers fan growing up because that's when they were killing it. And I was like six. Right. So, but we have, we had the terrible Browns and then we had the terrible 49ers. So I get double dinged on that one. Except when Eddie, well, the, when Eddie ran the team, he was, he was the best owner in sports. I mean, what? Yeah. And then when Eddie had to the, give it up, yeah, Eddie has problems. He had to give it up, unfortunately. Yep. The, the well, and then the stretch that, you know, Alex Smith went in, he had, he had, so he had head coach after head coach. I mean, he had, you know, my, you know, Mike Singletary was a coach and a bunch of other like people you can't even remember. And then they finally make this splash by hiring this, this eccentric coach out of Stanford by the name of uh, Jim Harbaugh. Who benched him. And who, well, but before that, yeah, he was the first coach to believe in him. Yeah. And he gave him the reins and he let yeah. him, he actually let him be him. And he actually excelled until he got hurt. And then that's when he benched him in favor of Colin Kaepernick. And then, so, but then he moves on and Andy Reid believes in him. And it, it just goes to show that if, when you have belief in someone, when someone believes in you, you can really accomplish great things. And, you know, he is an incredible athlete. He's a really good quarterback. And, and um, you know, with what Andy Reid was, and then he, Alex Smith has kind of taken this thing of passing on. He took Colin Kaepernick under his wing. And that early success that Kaepernick had in his career, you know, you know, it was just as much in part to Harbaugh as it was to Alex Smith. Alex Smith helped him along too. Patrick Mahomes' success, you know, you, you could argue he's an incredibly talented athlete as well. And, you know, Reed probably, it definitely has something to do with it too, but it was also the tutelage that, that Smith unselfishly gave to him. And, um, and I was really excited about Dwayne Haskins going to the, you know, to the Washington football team because, I thought he could do the same thing there for him um, because I had my doubts of you. Coop, you might remember this when we were talking about the Giants, who they would take. And I was like, man, if Haskins goes to him, I mean, I, I had my doubts about Haskins, right. um, you know, the draft. And but I was really excited about him, you know, being under Alex Smith for a time because I thought, OK, well, he could learn from this guy. And so you're you're I, I'm really yeah, I'm, a, I'm an Alex Smith fan. And uh, and so I'm really excited that he was able to come back from just such such adversity and he this isn't the first this is certainly the biggest bump in the road he's had but it's not the first one and he has incredible incredible fortitude and it's uh, yeah i'm really really excited i'm glad you highlighted it yeah let me say one more thing before we kind of move on to the second story um 
Septus um, is something people really need to pay attention to. Uh, the Septus Alliance at septus.org. Uh, pay attention to that site. Um, it, because they do raise money, right? But there's also, they promote a lot of awareness with, with Septus and, and how, you know, I, I did, if I had read that sign, a site and, and learned about the signs that you are coming down with this, I probably wouldn't have gotten to a point where I had to be hospitalized. Maybe I wouldn't, have, I probably would have been hospitalized, but there was some real, I had some complications that I was very lucky to come out of that with, right? Um, the other thing what I'll say is with COVID right now, there's a lot of risk with septus, especially if you're in a hospital. If you're in a hospital, septus is a real thing that can happen uh, with surgeries or anything like that. Um, so, you know, pay some awareness to this at, at times. It, it's, it does kill a lot of people every year. Um, and even when you have it, it changes your life. The rest of your life is going to be changed after that. And, and you've heard me on the show talk about how it's changed a lot of things in my life right now. So, so pay attention to Septus, uh, Septus Alliance is a good organization that promotes awareness with this. And so stay tuned with that, you know. Okay, Bear, your, your, your story. Well, Tony, my, my, my pick for good things are happening here this week was inspired by you and the project that we talked about earlier in the show, uh, which is the give a fuck uh, project that you and Robert are working on. And uh, there's a really great story happening in my area uh, right here in North Texas um, in Fort Worth, uh, a fifth grader named o Orion Jean. Okay. So he's a fifth grader and his goal is to get to it's called he calls it the race to 100 as race to kindness okay so he's trying to get a hundred thousand meals to families in need before thanksgiving wow and um he's a fifth grader he's a kid and he's he's doing this incredibly great project and um so right now you know, he, and he's donating all over the area. I mean, as far north of us as Tulsa, Oklahoma to Dallas, Texas, you can do drop offs in these different places and stuff. And uh, it's highlighted in a link that I have uh, coop in the show notes. You can certainly publish it on the show notes. Uh, yep, there'll be, get, all, these, uh, all these links will be there. Yeah. And it just, it really, it really inspired me uh, because I knew that we were having Tony on as a guest and what him and Robert have done with the give a fuck project and everything. And it's just uh really really cool story and the, he they even have a way a, re, a, a, a website it's race to kindness and this this kid is the embodiment of of joy and 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 as the name would suggest and and kindness he's really he's he, him and his family are really putting forth this effort to really build the community communities multiple communities around him um to to help out families in need and what a what a now more than ever especially with covid um you know, there's a lot more families in need than that, you know, that probably, you know, if you'd asked them a year ago, they're not in the situation they are this year. And, and they're, they are now a family in need and he's, he's spreading that joy and spreading that kindness. And he's going to make sure that they have, that they, they have meals and it's just a incredible, incredible uh, act. And I'm really excited for what's going on in my, um, my hometown here. And um, it's just, it's just awesome. You know what's great and kind of tragic about that story at the same time is like you never and I will I'm not obvious I would never get political and I'll just put a blanket over this is you never see a politician do something like that on either side. You never see them really give back to the community. Not that I've seen locally um, or on a, on a federal scale. And I think that that's something that these guys should be more focused on is taking care of the people in their and their immediate constituencies, you know, um, mm -hmm. they have the power to do it. And they just, I, I, I feel like they're too concerned about getting their job back and that's all sides of it. Yeah. Yeah. They have to leave office like Jimmy Carter and, yeah. <laughs> and then they actually start giving a shit <laughs> They give, a, they give a fuck. They give a fuck. <laughs> and, and what, yeah. What, yeah. Like Jimmy Carter's done for, you know, Habitat, you know, over the last, you know, 40 years has been incredible, but no, I, I, I I could agree with that point, Tony. I think that's fair. Um, I just wish, and, I mean, and there's some that do. I just wish I saw more of it because they have the power yeah, to do no, it. 100%. And, you know, that's kind of what they're supposed to do. So, awesome. so that's uh, that's my highlight for uh, that's great a great story. I, I got to look up that kid. Yeah, that's a great. It is a really good story. Good job there on that. Um, 
how you do, Tony? You still good on time? We have a couple more things we want to do. Yeah, I'm good. Awesome. If you need to go, we totally understand it, but love to have you as well. Um, so I um, want to mention a couple more sponsors. Uh, Illusioni Cigar, deep in flavor, deep in your mind. We are not industry standard. Illusioni Cigars. Uh, Bear, you want me to take this one? Uh, yes, if you don't mind. Sure. So we we'll all mentioned Michael's Tobacco. With just over a decade of ownership, Michael's Tobacco has become the premier tobacconist for the Dallas, Fort Worth metro area and cigar patrons the world over. With two convenient locations in U.S. Texas, just a quick jump from the DFW airport and Keller, Texas, Michael's Tobacco stands as a beacon for the Texas cigar retailers. Michael's was the very first cigar lounge in the state of Texas to add a full bar to its ever-growing accommodations list. Proprietor Meg Peacock is a former IPCBR board member and now has made Michael's a family affair by having his son, Bob, join the ownership boards. Under general manager and master Sarah Teller, Tracy Spence's leadership at Michael's, his self-proclaimed greatest accomplishment has been assembling, quote, the greatest cigar team in the retail business, unquote, as well as some of the finest relationships with the industry's most respected individuals. Inventory director Jason Fields handles and maintains two of the area's proudest humidors containing premium cigars for everyone from the everyday smoker to the most ardent collector of rare puros. Under Mike, Bob, Tracy, and Jason's example, they have been listed as staff that includes Kevin, Austin, Bad, Joe, Silas, and Brandon that collectively boast over 100 years of combined industry experience. Together, they have brought a true and blessed mainstay for their respective communities. Whether you're celebrating an anniversary, birthday, home one, or just a desire to relax, Michael Swack will have the perfect cigar waiting for you, an exquisite beverage pairing, and lively conversation. Visit michaelstobacco.com for more details and a calendar of upcoming events. Michael's Tobacco, not just a cigar shop, but the perfect blend of Texas hospitality and the days of yore. So in this next segment, um, this is another little fun topic that's come up. Um, we have heard this term GOAT. I hate the acronym, first of all. I'll say it very clearly. This GOAT, uh, greatest of all time. And it's it's gotten, again, there's a little bit of, a, of an Ohio connection here because we've seen it recently with the comparisons of LeBron James to Michael Jordan. We have seen it with Tom Brady. Um, in the NFL, where, you know, the, the debate rages on, are these guys the goats of all time? Um, you know, it's interesting, Bear, we'll kind of get, I think this is always an overrated conversation, right? But we're going to have a little fun with it because we're going to turn it away from sports in a second. Um, but I think it's an overrated conversation because I don't believe in comparing act, uh, athletes between errors because games change so much. So, you know, if you're saying – I'm not going to take anything away from what LeBron James does. He is a great player. But, you know, Michael Jordan played in a very different era of the game. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played in a very different era of the game. Um, as Tom Brady plays very different than when Joe Montana played, right? So I'm not taking anything away from them. And at the same time, I'm not taking anything away from their presses. So I think it's an overrated argument. I don't know what your thoughts are with that. Um. Tony, I just sent that link for a race to kindness to you over awesome. uh, Facebook Messenger. Um, Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with you, Coop. Um, I think that, um, I think that, uh, I think the goat, the quote unquote goat conversation is a little bit overplayed, um, simply because I think you know, and I go back to this conversation that I had with my brother when Tom Brady had that historic comeback. Um, against the Falcons in the Super Bowl, right? And um, he said, man, what are we watching here? And I said, we're watching one of the greatest football players do his thing. Yeah. Let's just enjoy it. And and that got me thinking a lot about this GOAT conversation because I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the most common, and Tony can attest to this too, it's the most common conversation in a cigar shop, right? You know, who's on your, who's your all-time pitching rotation? Who's your, you know, who's your all-time greatest pitcher? Who's your all-time greatest hockey player? You know, who's the, who's the greatest of this? Who's the greatest in this era? You know, who's your favorite, you know, mus you, musicians, everything like, you know, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the pinnacle lounge conversation. Right. And, and I, and I, I completely agree. Cause I think it is a little bit overplayed. Why couldn't we can't sit back and just enjoy what they, yeah what what it is like why do we have to exhaust and and just have this conversation between michael jordan and lebron why can't we just enjoy what lebron's bringing to the game of basketball i mean take, he's an incredible athlete aside. take take the off the court stuff aside yeah exactly yeah and why can't we just enjoy watching yeah truly an outstanding athlete the top of his game the longevity what he's been able to do 
yeah, no. Did he has he won as many championships? No, he hasn't. Has he many won as many in a row as as Jordan has? He hasn't. Um, and I I certainly have my opinion on who I think would you know overall who is a better player. And I I you know it's not like I I uh, it's not like I take my way, myself out of these conversations. I'm not above it, right? I'm not being a snob. Um, but I, I I agree with you, Coop. I think it is a little bit overplayed. We don't see this come up with hockey because of Gretzky. I think all of us, a lot of us saw Gretzky play. So hockey is never, that's never really been a debate with hockey. Baseball is interesting. Yeah, I mean, we don't, and baseball is a different reason. It never comes up in baseball. Is baseball, know. baseball understands the fundamental truth of it. What I just said, baseball mm-hmm. understands that there's eras yeah, and that you can't compare, you can't compare Babe Ruth to Barry Bonds. You can't compare Willie Mays to Mike Trout. You, you can't compare, I mean, even let's go even further down the line. You can't compare uh, even Pete Rose to Tony Gwynn, who played really close together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In terms you- of, in terms of, you know, you know, time in the, in the, in the baseball spectrum, it, it, it you, baseball fans understand this it's the rest of the world that doesn't yeah <laughs> in my I, 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 yeah i think you're i think you nailed it with that i think you totally nailed it with that um that being said um you know we're a cigar show right so of course i pose the question as far as the great blenders we've had we're going to focus this on the blenders who is the goat of blenders in the cigar industry. One person. And it's, it's, it's an interesting conversation piece. We don't ever hear that brought up in the cigar industry. No, no, we don't. Um, and, uh, you know, when you, when you brought up this idea of this topic to me, Coop, I, I mean, I, I certainly had my reservations about it because yep. like I immediately started having things fly through my head and, and, uh, like, are we talking about, do you, are we, are, you know, I looked at it from a baseball perspective. Are we talking about eras? Are we talking about dead? Are we talking about alive? Are we, you know, well, like, again, how do we do this? And you're like, nope, just one, just one, just, just go. And I'm like, and I want to our audience <laughs> out there. If our audience is out there and there's still folks who are tuned in here, who do you think is the goat of cigar blenders? We've already got one guy, Scott, big Scott's already chiming in. What do you say? Hendrick. That's a good one. Oh, is he talking about something? Yeah, no. No, he's talking about yeah, 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 Hanky. Yeah. Yeah, Hanky. I think he's talking Hanky, probably. That's a good one. That's a really good one. It was one actually I, I thought about too. I think, I mean, for me, it's Carlos Fuentes Sr. and Sosa as a team. I think that's a really good one, Tony. That's a really, really good one. He was my pick as well. Um, and and you have to look at, yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. And, and, and what Carlito's done, his son, Carlito will be the first one, I think, to say, it was because of his father as well, who's been able and Carlito then. Mm. But yeah, I, I I had Carlos Fuente Senior as the one I picked. And it's a toss up between the for me the Fuentes and the Padrones for sure. I yeah. mean, and we're gonna talk a little more about that in a second. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, that's a very yeah. But yeah, but I but here's the thing: like you can't talk about a, a greatest of all time without a bias, right? So I grew up with. Fuente, right? As you know, my dad smoked eight five eights when they were like ten cents or something crazy. <laughs> like, I mean, I know Cameroon tobacco better than any. That's why I'm so scared to ever make a cigar out of it because I can. I know Fuente Cameroon like the back of my hand because I've I grew up with it since my dad would smoke cigars and still does in the house, which I now smoke in the house ironically enough but good for you um i don't have a wife yet we'll see how that goes <laughs> so um but you know my dad would come home at 9 30 or 10 o'clock at night with an 8 5 waiter an 8 5 8 or a hemingway 
And I knew he was home because I, I didn't hear him, but I could smell the cigar. So I could smell Cameroon tobacco and taste and now taste it above all others. And Barry, you and I talked about, about Cameroon and how special mm-hmm. it is to me. But just the, the, over, the cigars in general and what the Fuentes have done for the industry combined, I think that's where, that's where my, my goat quote unquote. I'm, I'm is. Tony, I'm lock stock in agreement with you on this one. Um, again, what Carl, Carlos Sr. did in the 60s when the embargo happened, and that's when he started looking for other alternative sources of tobacco. He was ahead of the game with everyone with that. Um, even up until the last cigar he did, um, the Divine Inspiration, he was in the hospital uh, mm-hmm. at, in New York, and he called up the factory and, and basically blended the cigar over the phone. Um, I mean, and then the Divine Inspiration on the Casa Cuba line, amazing cigar. Um, so, yeah, to me, the other choice I had was, and Alan Rubin mentioned it, uh, Benji Menendez was, my, was, was another choice. I was, it was like between those yep. two. Um, but, yeah, I, I picked Carlos Sr. as well. The history, like, he's the, like, we, we do the person of the year, and Bear, I think the year before you came on board, uh, that was the choice. Um, Car- he won it posthumously in, in 2016, person of the year. Um, so, okay. yep. Yeah, so the, the, again, that's we know we don't like to do a posthumous thing, but that was such a the loss that we had that year. Um, yeah, and 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 Alan also mentioned uh, Mr. Jose Orlando Padron as well. So, I mean, those are and I would say, I would say the most the underdog goat is Ernesto Cano for sure. He could be like he, that guy. I mean, for what that what he has contributed to the industry, I think. 50 years in business, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's a a sleeper that just, I think is one of the greatest. Oh, absolutely. I mean, La Gloria, La Gloria Cubana is like one of the greatest cigars ever made. Sure. It was. And yeah. yeah. Historically speaking, for sure. Yeah. Bear, who was your goat? So I, I I would be remiss. I think since we, uh, Goop, you said, you said you, we weren't going to throw out some. I know. And I changed my mind and I changed my mind. Yeah. So, so, so in the in the spirit of of that, I, I think there is one name that that uh, that isn't my choice, but I, I think does need does deserve the accolade and uh, and and at least to be a part of the conversation, um, because what he's built on with the you know uh, the first name mentioned in the chat was was Kellner, right? Yeah. And but a, a lot of ideas. Yeah, um, absolutely. What he's done on the shoulders of the Kellner family. Um, you know, you know, he even has, you know, his birthday cigar is called the Master Selection, and that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty, that's not a stretch at all because what he's been able to do on the shoulders of, you know, what the Kellners built and and taking those, you know, tobaccos that Davidoff, you know, has and and then also having fun with it by using like, you know, the the, the his one Master Selection that would apparently will probably never get released that we had a chance to smoke coop who's speaking oh, of cameroon, my Tony, goodness. It, featured, oh. it featured a cameroon rapper uh, Holy well, i haven't had this first for 60 it was for 65th birthday never, never released oh, we we got it at the store down in the dr that he i think it's his store he goes to it's his yeah. store yeah his store. yeah and oh my goodness holy shit holy shit that that's was so when, you, when you realize greatness that's yeah yeah a davidoff cameroon cigar that they wow. never released yeah yeah, that um, so I, I would be remiss not to mention him. Um, I'm Tony. Thank you for mentioning Carrillo because um, yeah, everyone on the show knows my my affection for that man. Yeah. Um, uh, but as I as I kind of started whittling it down, um, it was it was really really difficult for me. Um, <laughs> this was really difficult, um, because there's just so many and. Rolando Reyes was mentioned earlier in the chat. That's another, too. Go, that's, another great one. Yeah. All that's these someone names that been mentioned have been, there's not one bad name that's been mentioned in the chat. By that's, me. that's someone that, that's someone that, you know, if you ask a lot of people, like yeah. if you ask like Pete Johnson, yeah. if you ask Ernesto, if you ask some of these, 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 some of these all time greats in our business, they'll, Reyes is a name that always gets thrown into, Yeah. you know, Fuente Padron. Oh, Rolando Reyes. And, uh, and he gets thrown in there quite a bit. And, um, and everything so oh man I, I you know not to be 
you know, not to be so anticlimactic and, 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 and be so boring, but I, I'm going to have to agree with my esteemed colleagues on the show today. Um, I think what Carlos Fuente Sr. has done for the cigar industry, um, you know, his, his legacy is still, you know, is still felt with every single Fuente that you smoke. And, and that just, that in itself is incredible. I mean, you know, even though Opus was, was definitely a Carlito project, you know, it, you know, it was built on the shoulders of, of, of senior. And, um, and so I, I, I have to, I have to give it to Carlos Fuente senior. It's, it's so freaking difficult. How do you say it? But um, I, I have to, have to say i mean what he what he's done for the cigar industry um and you know consistency is the is the model that you know every cigar producer and obviously tony you can attest to that that goes shoots for and everything so um but yeah carlos fuente senior for me yep unanimous choice yeah alan said benji menendez i absolutely could make the argument for ben benji could be the greatest living one right now for sure um, and what he's done has been nothing short of amazing too. So I, I mean, I, I was, I was, those were the two names I had, uh, going into this. Uh, so, and you can, I could certainly, I kind of would like to see this debated more than, than, than some of these other ones, uh, because it's, I think there's such a positive we put on it with these guys. I mean, all the names that have been mentioned here, Arsenio Ramos as was mentioned, um, Lito. But he wasn't really a blender. He was more for fermentation. Yeah, yeah. His, I mean, his legacy, notwithstanding, like I don't want yeah. like like it's not a knock. <laughs> like <laughs> what Arsenio Ramos did, um, you know, for this industry too. I mean, that's I think that's the greatest thing about this industry too is that these these names that we've been dropping and mentioning and stuff, there there really isn't a wrong answer. Like as much as we pick on Alan Rubin for some of his, you know, you know. Hating hockey, hating hockey, hating <laughs> hockey. Yeah. Um, it just in general, his love for Seinfeld being another thing. Um, but as much <laughs> as we harp on, hey, him, I love Seinfeld. Like, uh oh, <laughs> my favorite show. Uh oh. <laughs> we'll save that argument. Stand alone, their time. <laughs> we'll, we'll, yeah, we're not Seinfeld. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, that that's what's really great about this industry. All these names they mentioned that like we're not going to fight you over it. You know, we're not, we're not gonna we're not gonna sit here and like rag on Alan Rubin for saying Benjamin and that. No, they're, 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 and, all these like, names are like, really good. Yeah, yeah. He mentioned Jose Sayas too, another great one. Um, oh yeah. And, um, I mean, I look at that. So have you have you been there? You you know, it's a resounding. They're all from the Dominican Republic. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, but no, if I you mean, ever go to uh, Tabacalera, the the private the club that Hanky owns. There's a a wall of portraits of like the greatest cigar manufacturers ever to live. I don't right. know if you've ever seen it or not. Yeah, we I were there. But... Yeah, we saw it. No, oh, we no. Coop, that's he's talking about. He's talking about the cigar shop we were at. Like, it's, oh, a, yeah. it's the oh, private yeah. club yeah. that Hank yeah. owns. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. There's okay, that, yeah. There's the wall, and it's like every single one of those guys we mentioned is on that wall. And I I looked at that wall and I was like, holy shit! Like that's that's legendary those guys like those guys are led like literally some are living legends but they're all legends it's like Lido, benji uh all the guys we we mentioned carlos senior hanky uh who else is up Lido's up there like all those guys are just legendary cigar manufacturers and yeah i mean he... yeah uh... is, is padron the only one outside of the dr yeah wow Wow. Yeah, you think about that one. Uh, well, Rolando Reyes. Rolando Reyes, you could put in there as well. Yeah, Rolando. And we Honduras, should, you know, the other, the, the other name I had is Julio Aroa, too. That was the other one. I mean, with Julio. I agree with you. Yeah, Julio Aroa should be on that list as well. Um, he was another one I was considering when I was whittling this down. Uh, but I look at Julio more as an agronomist, and that's kind of why I kind of went as far. When I said, okay, we're, we're limiting it to Blender, um, that's kind of how I went with that. that so that. Uh, but Julio's done some amazing blends too, you know, especially bringing back Corojo, the uh, you know to Nicaragua, excuse me, Honduras. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a yeah. Good. I mean, 
you, I mean, you could keep going down the rabbit hole with this. I mean, if, if we wanted to step into Nicaragua, you could talk about Fernandez. You could talk about, you know, Nick Perdomo. Yeah, I mean, we may um, see that we may because, see their careers still have a long way to go. These guys, though. Yeah. So they're, yeah, they're Nicaragua. Yeah. I mean, Nicaragua a baby, right? You think about Nicaragua. Yeah, it really is. Just, yeah, it's in. You know, these guys still have another thirty years ahead of them. So we have. Yeah, I mean, we, we may not we, see what how their careers are going to finish out. Yeah, we talked about this with Nick when we had him on a show or right. uh, just uh, just a while ago. You know, he's still you know he, he's he's been doing this for a very long time, but he's yeah. still got a lot of lot of career left. You know. Yeah. For an example and stuff, but yeah, I mean, as it stands today, I mean, like I said, it was not an easy decision. Um, no, and I think all the people that we've mentioned, you know, they 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 stand on their they stand on their own, and they have their. Uh, what's really interesting is that they all have their very unique legacy that they've brought to. It's they're, they're the very distinct, unique mark that they've left left on the industry or are leaving if they're currently alive, uh, which is really which is really actually where you where it becomes even more fascinating you know you talk about fuente with you know with cameroon and the dominican or in the dominican rapper with opus you talk about you know padrone and putting nicaragua on the map you talk about uh rolando reyes and uh the 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 reverence that he gets from manufacturers and blenders and people in this business from all over the place and you know iroa for his contribution when it comes to farming um, that's very distinct and very yeah. unique. And yeah. They all, they all left their, they've all left their mark or are leaving their mark in a very, very, very specific, unique way. And I think that that's what makes this, con this conversation even more interesting as you peel back the layers and you can go, like I said, we could go down the rabbit hole and this could be a conversation. This could be, you know, I guess it's just the nerd of me could be a far more interesting and deeper discussion than who's better uh, LeBron or Michael. Or, I, I, you know, I totally, I totally agree because I think the well, problem, I think, I, yeah, go ahead, Tony. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I think that another contributing factor is like how, you know, they've paved, how they've paved the ways for others to continue. Right. So <clears throat> for me personally, like I was, I'm motivated and I idolize Carlos senior, right. And Carlito. And those these guys are like the reason in the cigar business. And I even I even will go as far as saying, you know, Rocky Patel, Illusione and Pete Johnson are like other motivators for me as being right. a young person in the, yep. in, in the industry. So I think that like if you go up the chain from a 36 year old cigar manufacturer to a cigar manufacturer or blender that is passed. I think that an important thing to, to keep in consideration is is the legacy and how to continue the cigar industry thus forward and how they've impacted that on top of like the incredible cigars that they've made. But also, um, you know, I, I kind of in my head took into consideration like the legacy that they've left. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And what I think what's important you know, what I've seen Fuente do, and we've talked a lot about Fuente kind of coming out from behind the curtain, and they're a lot more visible this year, particularly with the, the online channels, is I think Carlito, and he said this when we had him on KMA Radio, it was important for him to tell the story of his father because there's not podcasts with his father on this thing right now, right? And this right. is given an opportunity. Uh, we had Jeremiah Merrifel on, on, the, on the Thursday show, and again, there were things we learned about this that you know like i said today we're spoiled because of all these channels we have but you go back 15 years ago you didn't have this right so now it's important like we can see carlito and, and george padron start to, to tell the stories about these things that we really haven't heard before so speaking yeah, I, of, go ahead go bear well well no, i was just gonna say uh, as a footnote i think that what what really kind of kind of has been a catalyst for this discussion even more so and, and has brought it to a really stark reality for us is uh was the documentary hand rolled um you know these are you know the hand rolled uh, collaboratively brought brought these legends to the screen in a very real way you know and some of them had uh, carla senior had already passed at that time um but you saw you saw Carlito speaking about his father and the legacy that he left. Yep. You know, it was the last interview that uh, 
you know, you know, Jose Orlando Padron had ever done. Yep. And he was, you got to hear it in his own words, which was just so eerie to know that, you know, that, you know, after he spoke those words, not long after he spoke those words on tape, he, he, he was no longer with us. And, yeah. and, um, and, you know, you know, other, you know, others mentioned in that documentary, it just, it really, for me, it, as, as much of a student as I've become of the tobacco industry and the, the history of the premium cigar industry, um, it brought those, those characters and that lore and that mystique into to Technicolor for me. Um, you know, I, I think beforehand rolled, I, I kind of looked at the cigar industry almost in a black, you know, classic black and white form, you know, in textbook form and had an opportunity to meet a lot of these great people. But I met a lot of second and third generation folks, which have made a profound impact on the industry as it were too. But it's these gentlemen that we've mentioned tonight um, that you got to see in Technicolor and, and sometimes it actually in, in the case of Padron in the flesh, yeah, um, which was, uh, you know, just just incredible and opened it up to a much wider audience that you may have never seen before um so good job by by that we mentioned um carlos uh see we mentioned the fuente and the padron families um last question of the night or last topic of the night is obviously the the project they've announced um that's coming uh, at pca next year um assuming there is a PCA and I think that's going to play a key role on when this project's delivered. Um, historic. I mean, it, I, I kind of gone back. This is, uh, it was, it was one of the most exciting things that I've got a chance to write about on Coop in 10 years. I mean, to write about that, to kind of follow that. Um, and we're, I know we're going to have more about this on future shows. We're going to be talking about this uh, in, in the next year, but I think it's just historic. I mean, what, what, what we're seeing come together with these two guys, with these two families right now. Something I never thought we'd see in my lifetime. And it, for me, like when I saw it, it's like one of those like <clears throat> things like you always dream would happen. And then when it happens, you're just like, what? Like, it's real. Is this real? Is this real life? Is this yeah. really happening? Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's that's what I that's kind of what when I saw <clears throat> when I saw the news that, that it was happening, that, that was kind of my reaction to it was kind of like, holy shit, like this is really happening. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it's like I said, it's a it's a great thing for happening in the industry right now. And like I said, the, the sons are very much in their own right. You know, Mount Rushmore Hall of Famers, if you want to call it Carlito and, and George. Mm-hmm. So, I mean. You know, and, and look, we had we had him on. We had Carlito on KMA as well. And I heard George Padron when he was on Carlito's show. Both of them. I think this is a legitimately this isn't. A, I mean, I really believe when they say this is not a money making project. I really believe this was. I mean, I'm going to use the bear word passion. There's nothing more I can say. I believe they did not need to do this. They wanted to do this. And it's probably going to be a limited cigar, so I don't think they're going to make tons of revenue off of it right and it's, it sounds like there's gonna be a charity angle to it on top of it so like i said i think it's a, i think it's a great thing we're seeing i agree and the industry needs more of it yeah you know i i think that and i think this sets a good precedent you know i just for me like in, in my in my humble opinion i think that what we are <clears throat> lacking in the industry is unity and I think that it's very important for someone to set the precedent that it's okay to be friends and it's okay to, to collaborate and it's okay to like push this industry to 2021, you know, and, but those are my thoughts on it. And I think that that's very important for the survival of this, of this small industry that cigars. I, I, I completely agree. Uh, is it going to, is it going to heal everything in the industry? No. But when you see, step. but it's a step. Exactly. It's a step. It's others can look at this now and say, well, what can we do? You know, and there's other companies. That's a, so I agree. It's a step. Well, the way I looked at it when I first started the project and everything, I, I kind of had a similar reaction to Tony it was just like, 
it, it, it and it, but it, it also seemed it is as just kind of dreamlike. It, You're very free it seemed okay. it also seemed very natural. Okay. Am I not here? Can you? Uh, yeah, 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 it also seemed, yeah, yeah. God, we didn't miss yeah, one. It, yeah. it also seemed very natural at the same time. Like it was like, yeah, why, why wouldn't, why wouldn't they do this? This makes total sense because we just mentioned them in the same breath a moment ago in the goat conversation, right? So like, why, why wouldn't this seem like a, a natural choice for them? And I, I think. Um, you know, Coop, we, we, we mentioned this on the tribute show, you know, with, uh, with Padron's uh, passing, yeah. the, the entire, uh, entire show that we dedicated in his honor and was that the Padron family, the Fuente family, the, um, you know, here was a name that we, that we missed in our conversation, Placencia family, yeah, that's the another. Oliva, Oliva family. These are, they, they had all had a very similar trajectory They're, the story is also very similar you know you know leaving exile you know leaving uh, their homeland in cuba into exile and these are all you know examples of the the quote unquote american dream which is just beautiful and they just align perfectly and and what a way to what a way to honor two of the f finest gentlemen to ever to ever grace us with uh, with their gifts that they gave us to the world, and now they're in even posthumously, they're giving us another gift, and they're giving it even and even better, they're giving it through their sons, and and what you know as a father of sons, it you know it's very it's a very emotional subject for me. Um, is uh, you know as I've alluded on my, this show several times, Coop. Uh, you know I, I honor my father all the time. I, I bring out my dad's quotes all the time on the show, and and so you know to be able to honor my father uh, is is something that you know that is very 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 personal to me. So I, I know how personal that George and and Carlito are going to take it, and so it's it's going to be a beautiful thing for everyone from the consumer all the way to other manufacturers and brand owners like Tony and Robert and some of the other folks that we've mentioned tonight. And I mean, this, what I'm really excited about is I hope this, like what your project of lost and found Tony did. I hope it does the same thing. Like, I hope we see, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to throw out some crazy stuff. Like what if, you know, you know, what if um, Klaus Kellner and Lizette Perez Carrillo did this? Down you the road, know, yeah. Down the road. What if, you know, Nick Perdomo Jr. and, you know, you know, did it with, you know, did it with somebody else, you know, did it with the Rubens, the Ruben boys. Right. You know, I mean... Can you can you just like there's just so many infinite possibilities, and you your your mind as a super fan as an and me as a nerd just kind of goes into hyperdrive like this could be a beautiful catalyst for what this industry needs in terms of uniting, you know, a very you know, this industry is fractured right now in a lot of ways you know it's you know it's, and so it could do it could do a world of good. And I only see the I only see the positives, and I'm so I'm so excited. I'm so excited about this project. I think it's going to be phenomenal. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so we're getting to the end of our show. Um, I want to thank Tony very much uh, for being a part of the whole show tonight. This was great. Uh, so really do appreciate it. Great yes. conversation. Um, really glad to have you on. You'll be back for sure. Um, a pleasure. Yeah, hopefully Thank we'll you, see. Tony. Hopefully we'll see each other soon. That's in person. Um, that's yeah, I know. That's most important. Um, and uh, I want to just mention a couple, a few other shows we have coming up in the next week uh, on the prime time because we have some really good ones. Let's start off with uh, we're going to be on the air a week from today, uh, election day, and we're going to have an election return show. Um, and it's going to be a unpolitical show. I'm hopefully not going to have to ban anyone from the page, right? Um, but we're going. To, we, we Bear and I did this um, a couple of times already in a smaller scale, mm -hmm. 
We did it with um, the midterm elections. The midterms, yeah. And we did it with Super Tuesday, um, which I'll talk a little about, especially the conversation we had on Super Tuesday. I think was, we'll, talk, we'll save that for the show. Um, but we're going to do it. Um, look, we know people are going to be following the returns. Um, if you, we're going to be talking cigar talk. We, I think we have a special guest coming on. We have to confirm that, I think, for sh- one more time. But we, we'll, we'll be on that night. Um, well, I have a question for you real quick. What, yeah. what happened to your show the night you did my show? We don't do every Tuesday. Oh, okay. We only do two Tuesdays a month because this is a, a little bit of a longer format. And uh, Barry and I both have the other shows. I, did, I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know if I fell on that. Uh, no, that's probably why you did the show on that night. That was why I think we when, when I when I talked okay. to uh, Jeremy, yeah, we, we we scheduled it out on a night we weren't doing the show. Gotcha. Right, okay. So, we, so and that's why that I gotten yeah, that's that why I would have back on you, Tony, so that you know, make sure that you know we we schedule a date to where you know I'm not doing the show, yeah. obviously. Yeah, really for sure. Back-to-backs. Yeah, but I think yeah. So I think we'll be doing that. Um, and like I said, we'll have cigar talk in there as well. So, um, you know, we'll so we'll be talking about the national election. I think we'll be talking about some of the uh, local elections too. Uh, again, just kind of looking at it. Uh, like people, you know, we're gonna just we're gonna keep the politics out of it. So, um, you know, and uh, we want everyone to feel welcome that night. So I'm asking our audience to make everyone feel welcome that night because I've been very hesitant over the over the stuff we've seen over the last few weeks about I was having a lot of nerves about this show, but we're going to go forward with it. Um, so that will be next week. Uh, we'll be on the air, uh, the election night show. Stay tuned for that. Um, on the Thursday show, primetime on Thursday, we talked about um, we talked earlier about the Reyes, uh, Leo Reyes. Um, we're going to have on John Michelle Louis from Delos Race Cigars um, as our special guest. Um, 162 shows, and, and he's been mentioned on every show because uh, we've had a longstanding uh, partnership with the uh, Delos Race Cigars from day one and even before that. So, so we're going to be talking uh, Delos Race Cigars. Uh, and, and John Michelle is a really, I got the, he was a part of the tour I did there. This guy knows his stuff. So, um, very excited about that. He'll be making his primetime debut. And this is being announced for the first time because it was confirmed uh, this morning, uh, a week from that show, uh, which will be the um, November 5th show, primetime episode 163, uh, Steve Saka will be on. Did I lose everybody? No. Really We're excited here. for that. Yeah. Okay. I think, uh, yeah. I didn't know if I did. So, uh, yeah. So Steve Saka will be on that show. So, uh, some big show. Oh, um, we're going to be announcing the primetime shows for November, probably very soon. Um, there'll be three shows going into Thanksgiving. And if, if all the guests kind of fall through, um, it's going to be really good in, in November is what I'm just going to tell you. But uh, until we have like eyes dotted, I think we have eyes almost dotted. We just want to cross the T's right now on that so um so yeah stay stay tuned on that so we're very excited about that and then bear you have a show on sunday i do i do uh uh, take 143 uh will be coming uh like will be coming to you and i'm really excited about this show uh it'll be a return guest it'll be uh, his second appearance on ls fumar takes but it's going to be a completely different take because uh, Jason Lois will be returning uh, to LLC Fumar Takes, a uh, gentleman who was a uh, former uh, national uh, cigar smoking champion competing in the world championships. But now uh, he's he's a he's an industry veteran, uh, done a lot of stuff in this industry. And, uh, you know, our, our you know, the birthday boy, Jose Blanco, has uh, even said that he has that Jason has one of the uh, most profound uh, palates that he's, he's ever run across in this industry, which is an incredible compliment coming from Jose. Um, Jason is uh, now uh, running things over at Veritas Cigars, and he is launching his own brand, Chateau Manifesto. So we'll be smoking some Chateau Manifesto on the show, talking about that, talking about that launch and and uh, Jason's new role at Veritas. So I'm really excited about having Jason back on. So it'll be really exciting. Yep. And then I'd be remiss. We'll, we'll mention a couple other things. Oh, the week after is Lazona Palooza week, and um, all of us will be doing shows that week. For Lizona, That's please. Correct. You'll be doing one on Sunday. I think Aaron and Developing mm-hmm. Palettes are doing Monday, and then we're going to be on three Tuesdays in a row, which is very unusual. Uh, we'll be doing the Tuesday Lizona Palooza. 
So uh, we'll be all part. Yeah, all my different. third, my third anniversary show with uh, Pier Twenty Eight's own Tim Wong for yeah. the third for third time. He was my very first take, and he's been on every anniversary show since. So yep. really excited. Yep. Tony, anything coming up on Four Shots you want to uh, promo? No, we're. I mean, t- on Tuesday we're doing like a, like if you don't want to watch this shit, come hang out with us. While the world, <laughs> while the whole entire world burns. Uh, yeah. get drunk with us kind of thing yep. uh, we're, we're, we'll, we'll and check are going in. right we'll, into it and you're you're taking the digression nice we'll yeah, have to check it. in with you guys before <laughs> the show. Yeah, we'll have to check in before you guys with the show yeah so uh no, well, you know what we should do is we should have like a like a check-in with you guys kind of thing like just how you doing what's yeah. going on over there is the world on fire we'll, we'll, <laughs> yeah we'll talk about it. i think that's a great idea yeah i'm in for it and you guys should do a shot just to get no, prepared yeah. for the shit show you're gonna have yeah. on your hands. We, gonna, we may need to. Yeah, we'll go. Just one coop, just one though. Oh one. man, I mean, I I do not want to play kindergarten cop on 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 next Tuesday, guys. Uh, you know, to our audience, please just like uh, let's let's kind of look at it from the let's look at it from you know, let's do it like we're looking we, at it from a historical perspective, as we oh, do yeah. oftentimes on the show. As yeah. I like to look at from things, yeah. and this is a, yeah. this is historical uh, election yeah. in a lot of different instances. And you can take the poli- we can take the politics out of it, and we are, um, because it is a historic election, and you know it, it, it's one of the most polarizing elections uh, during in, in a historic time. There is a worldwide pandemic going on. Yeah. Um, the early vote turnout has been really, really large, which is right. you know from an, from is awesome, you know, and you know it, this is this is going to be you know to throw out the word of 2020 unprecedented yeah. and so we're we're i'm excited about it and yeah. i and i fully i i'm i'm not scared at all i know you are i know you're a little nervous coop and you, I'm know, a lot our, of you know what we've got a great audience we've, and we're we're gonna encourage them to you know let's keep it clean yeah, let's yeah. keep it let's keep the politics yeah. out of it we're, we're and not, let's just observe history in the mm-hmm. making that's exactly what we're doing that's what we're gonna do and, and I'll, I'll make one final comment though if you go back to the super tuesday show i made a very big prediction of how things were going to go this fall and I'm, we'll, we'll talk a lot about that prediction what happened that mm-hmm. night so i think if you remember that was the uh, super tuesday so we were on that night. So uh, stay tuned for that. We'll kind of recap that. I think that, cause I think that'll be a good lead into the history of this election for sure. All right. Anyway, thank you again to our audience. Thank you, Tony uh, bear. Thank you. As always uh, a lot of stuff coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, that's going to wrap up primetime special edition 86 into the annals of history for Tuesday, October 27th. Now Wednesday, October 28th on the East coast. We'll see everybody on Thursday night and next week. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time. Cheers.